Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to begin. Action, please. So, to ensure uh, the smooth running of this conference, uh, please turn off your microphone and switch off your mobile phone to silent mode. Welcome to the final conference of the European Joint Action on Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infection, EUGMRI. My name is Sadika Bernard, I'm the project manager of EUGMRI, and uh, it's my pleasure to be your master of ceremony uh, of this conference. So after three and a half years, EUGMRI comes to an end. This morning, we will discuss how to scale up the EUGMRI concrete results to tackle AMR and reduce healthcare associated infections. I hope you will find this event enriching and inspiring and that you leave with a new idea and your renewed energy to continue tackling AMR. To start with, let me remind you that you can follow us on Twitter and tweet with the hashtags, hashtag EUGMRIConf, hashtag on, keep antibiotic working. I would also like to call your attention to some technical details. During this session, we will have some time for questions and answers. So please use the chat to send your questions. And we will also have a couple of quiz. So please do not be shy and participate. It's really easy and all have uh, to so follow the instruction that you will appear in your screen. And that's all. I declare open the final conference of EU Jumrai and it's a great honor to welcome Yazdan Yazdan Pana, the director of ANRS Immersion Infectious Disease Agency and director of Avicen Institute of Immunology, Inflammation and Infectiology Microbiology, and on behalf of Gilles Bloch, the president of the National Institute for Health and Medical Research in SEP. Yazdan, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I, I was sorry, I was not able. They said that it should be the organizer who activate my micro. So first of all, uh, good morning. And thanks a lot for, uh, for your inv invitation to present uh, um, the, uh, this presentation. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit and uh, remind you that this program was launched in September 2017 in Paris. It was bringing together 44 partners and over 40 stakeholders across 26 member states. What are our missions? Foster synergies among member states for a common European response, to facilitate the exchange of best practices and discussions among policy makers, to develop and implement effective One Health policies to counter the IMR and uh, HCIA, to develop new national actions plans on both IMR and uh, HCAI and the uh, implementation of existing ones. So these were the missions that we wanted to conduct during the last uh, four years. Uh, uh, what are, were the objectives directly against IMR and HCII? To identify and uh, test evidence-based measure uh, and provide uh, recommendations to policymakers regarding this, to bring together different networks of policymakers, experts and an organization, and to promote a One Health concept in all uh, policies. And finally, to issue recommendation and promote awareness and commitment by government and stakeholders. Uh, 
we during the last two, th three years uh, uh, strengthened national and European rebels against IMR. Uh, we had countries that visited drive one health IMR activities within EU. Uh, we constrained to member states self assessment of national actions plans and SWOT analysis through the creation of a EU network of bodies and institutions responsible for evaluation and supervision of IMR activities. Uh, also, through testing programs in place to uh, uh, prevent healthcare associated infections by identifying gaps in infection prevention and control programs by implementation of a universal infection control framework and by implementation of guidelines for prevention of catheter associated urinary uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, we, I hope, increase prudent use of antibiotics through antibiotic swordship. And for that, and with that regard, countries' surveys were conducted, allowing the publication uh, of guidelines, tools, and implementation methods for antibiotic swordship programs. Uh, uh, we also, through this ambition program, uh, actually improved uh, surveillance with the creation of a European antimicrobial resistance network um, in veterinary medicine uh, to fill the current surveillance gap of bacterial pathogen resistant data in disease animals. And I should say that this is probably extremely important because the World Health, as the One Health aspect of the program is extremely important. We prioritize and implement research and innovation by identifying research gap and fostering convergence of uh, most needs of nation and international research agendas by uh, detailing European strategies to incentivize public and private research and innovation and new antibiotics, alternatives, diagnosis, and strategies to combat IMR and healthcare uh, associated infection. Uh, and it, I wanted to emphasize here that the importance of research in the operational uh, uh, aspects of this program. Uh, we raised awareness on IMR and through promoting behavioral changes. Uh, uh, and of course, this aspect of the program is extremely important. Uh, we did that through implementing an online video campaign by organization of a webinar for journalists. We can see with COVID how important are journalists uh, regarding uh, the uh, uh, actually dissemination of knowledge. And I think probably this program uh, has started this upfront and it's extremely important. We developed online game application uh, in 18 languages to teach young audiences about pathogens, route of transmission, drugs, and the I IMR phenomena, uh, uh, generating the first global sandbar uh, for antibiotic resistance. When preparing this, I was just wondering, given what has been done, if we cannot probably do some of these things for COVID, where the combination is not that good actually with the public. Uh, we increase visibility of EU initiative to support member states. Uh, um, and progress and results were presented at almost 60 uh, events and 
through many dissemination tools, it, through ministerial conferences, European congresses, international journals, website, newsletters, etc. Uh, uh, we implemented a stakeholder forum with a self-monitoring and evaluation process to ensure uh, the connection of GPR, uh, GA, um, GAMRAI projects to the reality in the field. So I think that a big, a big, big uh, uh, amount of work has been conducted in the last four years. And I think that this is mainly thanks to the team. So uh, I wanted to, on behalf of uh, INSA, Gilles Bloch, and, but I think that everyone around the table here, thank Marie-Cissé Plois that uh, uh, brilliantly coordinated this ambitious uh, uh, program uh, uh, from beginning to the end. Uh, uh, and also, uh, thanks a lot, Sadika, uh, for all the help and for everything that has been done and all the EU uh, JAM uh, RI team. Also, to thank also the INSEM headquarters coordination that has uh, worked a lot. So, of course, Evelyn Jouvamas, but also. Uh, and Guia Carrera and Erika, who has done a lot also to, 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 for this. Uh, in some delegations in Toulouse and Bordeaux, of course, the, uh, our Ministry of Health uh, uh, in France, and uh, in the beginning, Christian Brambuisson, who helped a lot, and now Céline. Thanks a lot, Céline, uh, and their teams for, uh, uh, for, uh, for your help. And then, last but not least, all the European uh, union delegation of 44 partners from the 26 member states. I really think that uh, this joint action is a joint action that worked very well, thanks to all of you. Of course, to thank uh, 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 the, our DG Santé at the European Commission, Charles Price, uh, and also Jurgita Kamisakaite uh, for all her help. Thanks a lot and uh, thanks again for this important achievement on behalf of INSEM uh, and thanks to all the actors. Over. Thank you very much Yazdan for that wonderful keynote. Antimicrobial resistance is one of the top 10 global public threat health threats we currently face. Taken effective action to tackle is one of the Commission key priority in the area of health. It's a great honor to welcome Mr. Stefan Schreck, advisor for stakeholder relation from DG Santé. Mr. Schreck. Yes, good morning, everybody. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Um, okay. We can hear you, Mr. Shrek. You can hear me, but you can't see me. Okay, I will try to turn on the video. Can you see me now? Can you see me? Yes, wonderful. If you can see me and hear me, I can start. So, good morning, everybody. Yes, so um, I'm very happy to be here at this final conference of the Joint Action on Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare Associated Infection, which we all know as JAMRAI. And uh, on behalf of the European Commission's Director General for Health and Food Safety, um, I would like to thank the 26 member states of the European Union and the Eco European Economic Area, which are partners in this joint action, for all the work that, that you have done and specific thanks also from John Ryan, who is Director of Public Health. Um, I would like to, uh, to uh, also like to thank you for the good collaboration you have built up over the last three and a half years with NGOs, with WHO, with EU agencies and a huge range of other organizations, many of which are, I think, participating today. 
And uh, over the next two days, we will celebrate the achievements of the joint action, learn from your experiences and think about and plan our next steps to combat AMR. A lot has happened since the Commission first discussed with Member States the idea of jointly funding an action on antimicrobial resistance to help boost the development and implementation of national and local action in this important area. At the time Jamrai was first being discussed, the World Health Assembly had not yet adopted a global action plan on AMR. The Commission had not adopted its European One Health Action Plan on AMR. And uh, I was working myself uh, with the EU Health Programme, which funded the joint action. Um, from the outset, there was great enthusiasm from member states to participate. There was a growing awareness that unless much more robust action was taken to combat AMR, that it could turn from being a bad problem into a catastrophe. It was estimated that the global annual loss of life from antimicrobial resistance could rise from around 750,000 deaths per year in 2015 to 10 million per year by 2050. The World Bank estimated that annual global GDP could fall by up to 3.8% and global increases in healthcare costs may exceed $1 trillion per year due to AMR. But unlike many other serious public health problems, we actually know what to do to combat AMR. We need to stop excessive and inappropriate use of antimicrobials in humans and animals. Combating AMR means changing the way we use antibiotics. This means change by people who are responsible for the use of antibiotics as part of their everyday work in healthcare and agriculture and all the stakeholder organizations, businesses and governmental structures which help them to do their job. The key challenge for policymakers at EU and national level is how to effectively support action by other actors. For DG Santé, we see the joint action on AMR and HCAI as a key mechanism to help bridge this gap between policymaking at EU and national level and the front line. The work you have done in the last three and a half years has borne this out. The system of peer reviews of each other's plans, the development of tools and know-how for infection prevention and control, the development of a new symbol for AMR are exciting and important developments which deserve praise and congratulations. On wider scale, many of the member states in the joint action are beginning to see results in key indicators. 11 of the participating countries have seen falls in antibiotic consumption in humans since 2016. Most have seen falls in antibiotic sales for use in animals. Many member states have seen declines in resistance in some key indicator organisms such as MRSA. We look forward with eager anticipation to see what the trends in mortality from AMR will be when the ECDC produces its next estimates later this year. These improvements are welcome, but the overall picture is far from rosy. We continue to see increases in many parts of the EU in multiple resistance in the most serious infections due to gram-negative organisms. And we are still seeing a huge amount of poor prescribing practice in antibiotics as indicated by the ratio of prescribing of broad spectrum antibiotics to narrow spectrum antibiotics. It is hard to understand how GPs in some countries are able to treat patients with mostly narrow spectrum antibiotics, which have a lower tendency to contribute to AMR, while in other countries the reverse is true. And while many EU member states have put in place national AMR action plans, there are still some EU countries which have not, or who have not updated their action plans since the global action plan on AMR was adopted in 2016. And in all EU countries, there's huge potential for further reducing the numbers of resistance infections through simple but effective measures. For example, the OECD estimated that full implementation of enhanced hospital hygiene 
improved hand hygiene and antimicrobial stewardship could reduce AMR deaths by 40 to 60 percent. At the same time, there would be improvements in health systems efficiency. There is a clear message here. Our health systems need to be better engaged in the prudent use of antimicrobials and infection prevention. The massive loss of life from healthcare associated infections due to COVID-19 has underlined this message even further. Everyone on the call today is familiar with the 2017 European Action Plan against antimicrobial resistance. With its three goals, to make the EU a best practice region in tackling AMR, to boost AMR research and development, and to continue the EU's active international involvement on AMR. This action plan has made progress on AMR, but there is still a long way to go. That is why the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, made full implementation of the European One Health Action Plan against antimicrobial resistance one of the key areas of the mandate of our Commissioner for Health, Stella Kyriakides. In the first full year of her mandate, the Commission has of course focused on combating the COVID-19 pandemic. But we are also continuing work on antimicrobial resistance and on putting in place plans to strengthen the EU's approach to preparing and responding to serious cross-border health threats of which AMR and healthcare associated infections are two important examples. We have proposed a new EU for Health program with a much expanded budget. Action on AMR will be a key part of EU for Health. We have proposed strengthening the mandate of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and the European Medicines Agency. And we are proposing a new cross-border health regulation to strengthen existing EU law on responding to serious cross-border health threats. These actions will provide additional support to member states and stakeholders to take action to prevent disease and improve health. EU Jamrai has already shown the way on, on many of the actions needed to effectively tackle AMR and healthcare associated infection. We are all now waiting to learn more about Jamrai's achievements and to see how we can collaborate to take these forward in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shrek, for the inspiring insight. We indeed have to increase our effort to tackle AMR <laughs> and make the European region a leader in terms of reduction of the burden of EMR. The European Union has indeed adopted an action plan that EU Jumrai has had contributed to implement. A lot has been achieved, but more <coughs> needs to be done. And now, let me welcome Marie-Cécile Plois, the EU Jumrai coordinator. Marie-Cécile, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Shrek, for these inspiring words about our collective responsibility and the Commission's commitment to tackle AMR. As coordinator, I would like to thank all of you for attending this meeting, especially in these particular conditions. We initially planned to hold this final conference in Madrid. Unfortunately, Due to COVID pandemic, we had to organize an online meeting. But thanks to our fantastic communication team from the IAMPS Spanish Agency, you will assist during these two mornings to a dynamic meeting alternating between original graphic videos, testimonials, and live discussions. Around 500 people have registered to the final conference, and this morning we are almost 300 people and your presence today testifies of your continued commitment to tackling antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections. Remember, in September 2017, all key actors in the field of antimicrobial resistance gathered to address this major problem 
at an unprecedented ambition scale. EU's 26 member states, international organizations, and 45 stakeholders step forward to tackle antimicrobial resistance. I want to thank all part the partners involved in this joint action. You have all worked very hard. And today, I am happy we can show the tremendous amount of, of work and, above all health, the concrete actions we produced. UJAMRI was a unique place where all key players discussed and proposed solutions. We have shown that it is possible to offer collective actions to stop working in silo. We have initiated frank discussions with actors in the member states and with stakeholders. Now, I stop to speak to let you have a brief overview with a nice video of the main achievement of the last three years before welcoming Mrs. Saravina. And I wish you two very productive working morning. Thank you. Life-saving antibiotics revolutionized our society and economy. Previously deadly diseases became routine illnesses requiring little more than a brief treatment. These achievements are now at risk, mainly because of the excessive or inappropriate use of antimicrobials. The multiplication of national, European and international initiatives against antimicrobial resistance AMR, over the last decade reflect a shared commitment to actively tackle this global health threat. However, bridging the gap between declarations and concrete actions is the underpinning challenge that policymakers have to address. Supported by the EU Health Programme, the European Joint Action on Antimicrobial Resistance and Healthcare-Associated Infections, EU JAMRAI, has been a unique place gathering all key actors in the fight against AMR. EU JAMRAI brings together 44 partners from 26 member states, organisations such as the ECDC, EFSA, OECD and WHO, and 45 stakeholders involved in the field. Among them representatives of the civil society, health professionals, patient associations, actors from the animal and environmental sectors and companies. Its mission is to foster synergies among EU member states and propose concrete steps to strengthen the implementation of efficient and evidence-based One Health policies to tackle AMR and reduce healthcare-associated infections. AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is, as I said, a priority for us in the Commission and it's an explicit priority within the health programme. Well, AMR is a global issue and it's a One Health issue. We need to all work together to tackle this problem together because solving it in one place will, doesn't solve it in another place. You, Jamrai, has fostered synergies to keep antibiotics working, producing concrete recommendations and promoting awareness and commitment by governments and stakeholders. We cannot forget that the joint forces of policymakers, international organizations and stakeholders is paramount for success in the global battle against AMR. For three and a half years, EU JAMRAI partners have worked in key areas to effectively move forward down the road of antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections reduction. The role of the coordination team has been crucial orchestrating and supporting the different working areas. As coordinator, we had an umbrella role. We follow the progress of each task towards our final goals, uh, ensure that we are uh, respecting the UC rules and regulations, implement the appropriate strategies, being prepared for expected risk, and react on time to the unexpected ones. Monitor our work to make the necessary adjustments, uh, facilitate communication, ensure smooth management of um, the flow of information between the JAMRAI Consortium, the European Commission, CHAFEA and DG Santé. There are three more cross-sectoral working areas essential for the good performance of any project. 
EU JAMRAI progress and results have been presented at more than 60 AMR relevant events. Academic posters, abstracts and peer-reviewed journals have been accepted in several health congresses and published in recognised science journals. Results have also been disseminated through EU JAMRAI website, quarterly newsletters and different social media channels enhanced with the production of original contents like infographics and video interviews. Several actions need to be maintained beyond the three and a half year duration of EU JAMRAI to ensure the sustainability of its results. The overarching task of the sustainability team has been to foster the integration into national policies of the recommendations issued by the joint action and also to encourage all key actors to expand and sustain the implementation of EU JAMRAI results at all levels, European level, national level, regional level and local level. During the design of the EU JAMRAI integration and sustainability plan, we have used different tools such as workshop, meetings or survey to keep partners, stakeholders or member states engaged. Another important step has been the identification of the priority measures to be maintained beyond the EU jam rights end. We have also coordinated the production of different policy briefs to support advocacy efforts and ensure that our recommendations reach our target audiences. Evaluation and monitoring efforts have been conducted along the life of the EU JAMRAI to verify that the project was being implemented as planned, reached its objectives and met the needs of the target groups. We are responsible for evaluating the uh, activities of the project of the EU JAMRAI and especially to um, assure that the project reaches the targets that have been planned in the due time and also the quality of these targets, helping also the other participants and the other groups to have uh, high quality outputs. EU JAMRAI has contributed to the bridge the gap between declarations and actions presenting concrete and operational actions with demonstrated potential to tackle AMR and reduce healthcare associated infections. The joint action has coordinated the self-assessment of EU national action plans and used country-to-country -country visits to facilitate best practices exchange between member states. The basis for a network of supervisory bodies in the human health sector has been established to facilitate collaboration between member states and next steps will be discussed within the AMR One Health Network. Several campaigns to raise awareness, including a contest to find the first antibiotic resistance symbol, have been implemented. The evaluation of their impact and all lessons learned have been included in a toolkit for awareness raising and behaviour change communication on AMR. In the field of surveillance, EU JAMRAI has developed the framework of a surveillance network to monitor AMR in diseased animals, EARS, VET. In human health, a near real-time surveillance system has been piloted in 17 institutions from 11 countries. In order to increase the prudent use of antibiotics, a repository with existing guidelines, tools and implementation methods for antibiotic stewardship in human health has been published. EU JAMRAI has also performed a qualitative study to identify enablers and barriers to stewardship implementation. In animal health, the Joint Action has conducted a survey to identify the core components needed for optimal implementation of antimicrobial stewardship in animals. To reduce healthcare-associated infections, EU JAMRAI has identified the gaps on implementation research and communication in the field. To contribute to fill these gaps, the Joint Action has published a list of infection control and prevention research priorities and piloted the implementation of guidelines and frameworks. Finally, in order to improve antibiotic access and innovation, EU JAMRAI research team has conducted in-depth interviews in 13 countries to understand the barriers and facilitators for incentives implementation. These are the, the very practical things that the Joint Action is doing. Um, so the sharing experience, the creation of tools and good practice to really enable the take-up of that experience and the dissemination of the results and the working with partners, including with organisations which are not originally part of the joint action, which 
which want to help tackle antimicrobial resistance, whether the pharmaceutical companies, nursing organizations, doctors' organizations, students. We show it that working and acting together, we can prepare an ecosystem of key actors from different sectors with one shared mission, building a healthier European Union. The depth and richness of this joint action are attributable to our common commitment, insightful leadership and strength of our teamwork. That's the beauty of this joint action and that's what guarantees its success. We have worked together on a project that will leave a lasting mark thanks to concrete results and recommendation. Huge MRI results will enable countries to strengthen the implementation of efficient and evidence-based measures to tackle AMR for the benefit of EU member states and their citizens. To build a strong European health union that delivers to everyone, we need all actors on board. It has been was we were striving for since the inception of EU Shumrai. Thank you very much, Marie Cecile, for this wonderful talk, and thank you to the AMPS communication team for this great video. Fifteen members of European Parliament joined forces to boost European Parliament action to tackle EMR and form the only EMR dedicated group in the EP. This is a sign that the European Parliament can and is ready to play a key role in the fight against EMR. I'm delighted to welcome Mrs. Sarah Wiener, the chair of this MEP interest group. Mrs. Wiener, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Good morning to everybody. First, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this event, the final conference of the EU Joint Action of Antimicrobial Resistance <clears throat> and Healthcare Associated Infections. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today and address one of the topics that take priority in my work as an MEP. I think collaborative projects like EU JAMRAI which take a broad approach to the issue of AMR and bring together many different actors who work in different areas are urgently needed to combat the rising threat of antimicrobial resistance in the EU and the world. Because while we know that AMR poses a major threat to public health, we are not yet doing enough to stop this silently growing pandemic. This is also why my colleagues and I have come together to create the interest group on AMR in the European Parliament. We believe the Parliament can play a key role in boosting actions to tackle AMR at EU level. And the interest group provides a unique opportunity inside the Parliament to address this crucial issue, which affects not only the lives of Europeans, but it is a global threat. On EU level, I believe that the next months and years will be vital to step up the fight against AMR. While the COVID-19 crisis has exposed the weaknesses of our healthcare systems and revealed underlying inequalities, these are not new and have long been recognized in the fight against AMR. In this context, the Commission's pharmaceutical strategy for Europe provides momentum to bring positive change. It includes several legislative and non-legislative proposals that will be important. At the same time, we need to ensure that all these EU initiatives adopt a strong public interest and public health approach, from the revision of the pharmaceutical legislation to the setup of the new EU Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority, HERA called. Furthermore, we must not forget that COVID-19 pandemic led to the overburdening of many hospitals in EU countries. This is just another sign that we urgently need to act against AMR. 
For example, we need to address market failures in the development and new antibiotics. Without new antimicrobials and rising resistance, we are increasingly unable to fight even common infections. This is particularly important during a pandemic because it would lead to fewer hospitalizations and decrease the stress on the healthcare system at the time when hospitals are already struggling to cope. In addition, the EU should put the emphasis on prevention activities across sectors and foster research into alternatives such as fake therapy or natural antibiotics like archaeocene to reduce our dependence on common antibiotics. It should also set EU-wide consumption targets to reduce inappropriate prescribing practices, both in human and animal health, and support improved control mechanisms to ensure the targets are effectively met, particularly also on member state level. Again, I would like to emphasize that action against AMR needs to be taken across the spectrum. We need to raise awareness to the issue among the public policymakers, healthcare practitioners, and even farmers. It is crucial that we adopt a holistic perspective in the fight against AMR that includes the environment as well as human and animal health. And that is also why the One Health approach is so important. I very much welcome the fact that the EU Jamrai project took exactly this kind of broad approach to AMR. For example, by including both animal and human health in its reports on increasing the prudent use of antibiotics and on improving surveillance of antibiotic use. My work on AMR focuses mainly on the impact that animal farming has on the development on antimicrobial resistances. As I am sure you are aware, particularly industrial and intensive animal farming systems pose a strong risk for the development of resistant bacteria. If it is cheaper and easier for farmers to treat whole herds of animals with antibiotics than to implement farming practices that are in line with the natural requirements of the animals and therefore healthier, we need to act to change this for the sake of the animals, but also for the sake of our health. One important step in this area is the ambition to reduce overall EU sales of antimicrobials for farmed animals and aquacultures by 50% by 2030. This is part of the farm to fork strategy presented by the Commission in May last year. I very much welcome this strategy and I'm currently involved in negotiating the European Parliament's position on this issue as shadow rapporteur for the Greens in the ENVI committee. I will do my utmost to ensure that the EP adopts a strong position which also pays due attention to the issue of AMR. Another important step will be the implementation of the new EU regulation on veterinary medicinal products, which comes into force next year. As part of this legislation, the Commission is currently drafting a list of antibiotics which will be reserved for human use only. That means these antibiotics can no longer be used in animals. It is very important to set aside some of these so-called reserve antibiotics because we cannot risk to lose their effectiveness when treating bacterial infections. So this is a key moment for the EU to demonstrate leadership in the fight against AMR and I very much hope that it will live uh, um, uh, up to this challenge. To conclude, I think it is quite clear that above all, we need collaboration and cooperation in our fight against AMR across policy areas and sectors and between policymakers, scientists, as well as practitioners, stakeholders, and citizens. It is a complex and serious matter, but one we can and must tackle. I think the EU Jamrai project has set a good example for how we can pool knowledge and experience and work together across borders to stop this common threat. 
Thank you again for inviting me to the final conference. It has been a pleasure to speak to you today. I wish you all the best for the conference and look forward to listening to very interesting discussions and debates. Thank you, Mrs. Wiener. The commitment to ensure that EMR remains high on the EU policy agenda is crucial. Thank you very much for joining us. We will start now with the first session about strengthening networks and sharing best practices between member states to better support countries in addressing EMR. Let me welcome Mrs. Rosa Perrin, the World Package 5 leader and policy officer at the Dutch Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport and her guest speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Sadika, and hello, everyone, and welcome to this first session of the final conference of the EU JAMRAI, Strengthening Networks and Sharing Best Practices Between Member States. For those do, of you who do not know me, I am Rosa Peran, Senior uh, Advisor at the Dutch Ministry of Health, Welfare and Esport, and I was the work package, uh, one of the work package leaders of the <clears throat> joint action. But this was a very much collective task, and I am joining it today by my colleagues at the, of the Dutch team uh, that uh, are behind the scenes. You cannot see them, but uh, they are Elma, Lisanne, Marcel, Robin, and Peter. But let's go started and this session will focus today on the work of uh, one of the work package, the one on implementation of One Health national strategies and national action plans for antimicrobial resistance. So we will start with a video that shows the achievements done during the, this activity. During the first 18 months of EU JAMRAI, 14 participating countries completed several activities aimed at strengthening national response against AMR. The process followed the approach developed by WHO for the monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of the international health regulations through the joint external evaluation. In preparation for country-to-country -country visits, member states firstly self-assessed their national strategies and implementation of their national action plans and conducted a SWOT analysis. Member states performed the self-assessments to evaluate their national action plans and identify gaps. The results of the self-assessment raise a number of common issues. For example, difficulties in translating surveillance data into actions, the lack of resources, the challenge of working with a One Health approach as different areas require different priorities or difficulties with dealing responsibilities on national and regional level. Then three pilot country-to-country -country visits were organised. Building up on the results and experiences of these activities, the methodology for the country-to-country -country visits was revised and updated. Using this methodology, expert teams of 13 EU member states visited their peers in other EU countries. The objectives of these visits were to evaluate their national action plans and One Health strategies, exchange best practices and discuss about future policy options. These country visits have demonstrated to be an effective cooperation working method that enables the identification of highly relevant common topics to discuss at European level. Country-to-country -country visits have also strengthened national responses. In Greece, for example, the visit accelerated the discussion between ministries and allowed the finalisation of the One Health Greek National Action Plan, signed in 2019 by the three ministers, Health, Agriculture and Environment. 
Another example can be found in Germany. The planning of their five years national action plan was based on the results of the country to country visits and the joint external evaluation. The visits also facilitated that financing and support for evidence-based national treatment guidelines are now ongoing. One Health country visits are a driver to work on AMR within the European Union. Countries perform first the self-assessment. They analyze the results, identify the gaps, and reflect internally on how to improve the national situation. The country-to-country -country visit is the second step. This external assessment offers not only a more objective evaluation, but also the possibility to exchange views and experience and discuss about policy options with another country that might have experienced similar challenges. And visited countries don't feel audited because it is voluntary. The main conclusions of these country-to-country -country visits have been summarised on an interactive microsite that visualises who visited who and provides an overview of best practices for different AMR topics. Infection, prevention and control, surveillance, One Health, governance, coordination, awareness, supervision, budget, political commitment and antimicrobial stewardship. In order to ensure the sustainability of EU GEMRI work, we have selected several measures to be implemented into Member States' national action plans. One of them is the urgent need to establish common EU indicators and targets to monitor the progress of the implementation of each national action plan. These are crucial to ensure that all Member States reach the same level of achievements. EU GEMRI has established the basis for a network of supervisory bodies in the human health sector. The aim of the network is to facilitate collaboration and the exchange of views and best practices about shortcomings or common problems in the implementation, evaluation and supervision of AMR activities in the national action plans. The members of the network are competent authorities, professional associations or any other institutions in the member states responsible for the control, evaluation, enforcement or supervision of AMR related activities in the human health sector. Representatives of these authorities in different member states were interviewed to gather insights in the creation of the network. All of them highlighted the need for the establishment of a European network of supervisory bodies. The conclusions will be presented and the next steps will be further discussed within the AMR One Health Network. The result of the Jamarai project is that there is now a basis for a network of supervisory bodies working in the field of AMR. Given the fact that supervision or accreditation, certification or monitoring is organized differently among the participating countries, these countries seek opportunities to exchange experiences and best practices to contribute to be a driving force behind the national action plans. In this way, supervision can contribute to fight AMR even more effectively. We must acknowledge the importance of communication and coordination between European member states to tackle AMR. One of the main conclusions are from the work conducted by the One Health Strategies and National Action Plan team is that there is a pressing need to enhance cooperation between member states. An extended and strengthened AMR One Health network is crucial to achieve this purpose. This step is necessary to make the EU a best practice region. We will only obtain a full impact of the EU action plan against AMR if we address all the components of the One Health transsectoral approach. Thank you. And let's go now to the first part of the of the session, in which we have invited two countries uh, uh, to to explain us uh, and share the experience they had with the country to country basis. So let me uh, introduce first 
Michela Sabatucci from Italy. Michela is a biologist with a PhD in med medical bi microbiology. She works at the Directorate General Health Prevention of the Ministry of Health in Italy and is working on AMR and healthcare associated infections. And she has also been working at the Italian Institute of Health uh, ISS. And also welcome Dorota Zavitka. Dorota is clinical microbiologist with more than 30 years professional experience. She is the head of the National Reference Center for Susceptibility Testing of the Department of Epidemiology of the National Medicines Institute in Warsaw. And uh, she is poly representative at many European networks such as AirsNet. Both Michaela and uh, Dorota have been involved in the country to country visits and also in the network of supervisory bodies. So, um, welcome both, and let's start with Michaela presenting the experience of Italy. Michaela, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Rosa, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the leaders of the Italian team committed to the JAMRAI, and they are Dr. Pantossi and Dr. Busani from the ISS, Dr. Prato and Dr. Martinelli from the University of uh, Foggia, and uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Director General Dr. Rizza, Dr. Mariadino, and uh, Dr. Iannazzo. And, uh, in 2017, the Italian National Action Plan on AMR was approved and it was in line with the principles of the EU JAMRAI. Two years later, the coordinated fight against AMR allowed to benefit from the EU JAMRAI site visit by Poland to assess the NAP implementation and learning from each other. During the discussion with Polish experts, we agreed on the same priorities indicated in the NAP First of all, enhance the compliance of the hospitals to the infection prevention control standards and define a common set of indicators for IPC. So we developed the training courses on IPC for healthcare workers. We produced in Italian the complete and original version of the WHO online course on antimicrobial stewardship. We adapted the second course with clinical scenarios and a number of communication and education activities on AMR were performed. Um, we drafted a concept document and funded a pilot project on how to develop a national surveillance system for healthcare associated infections. We are working with some Italian scientific societies on a report on the appropriate use of antibiotics for the treatment of high due to multidrug resistant organisms that will be completed within 2021. In collaboration with the Italian Medicine Agency, we produced the two national reports on the human consumption of antibiotics for the years of 2018 and 2019. And we translated the WHO guidelines and the implementation manual on the management of the carbapenem resistant microorganism infections in hospitals. Um, we identified also indicators for the implementation of IPC and the pilot phase was carried out. Within the end of this year, the Istituto Superiore di Sanità will launch a national survey assessing the hospital consumption of hydroalcoholic gel for hand hygiene. And to address another recommendation the experts made us um, to increase the representativeness of the human AMR surveillance, the Ministry of Health issued the new protocol for the National AMR Surveillance ARIS and the National Surveillance of Carbapenem Resistant Enterobacterialis. And now ARIS covers um, over 40% of the days of hospitalization of Italy. And um, through the, the EU JAMRAI, we also shared some of our best practices, such as the veterinary digital prescription, CLASSIFAR, One Health Approach Regional Guidelines, and National Strategy to Tackle AMR to inspire other countries. So I think my time has finished. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Michela and uh, Dorota. Uh, go ahead, please, and uh, don't forget to share your slides with us. Uh, 
Thank you for good morning. Thank you for inviting me to talk uh, to this session. I hope you are able to see my slides. Uh, this is the interactive tool uh, which uh, was full screen. Okay. Um, Normal is down. Yes. Yeah, I think I I have only that that type. Maybe we will uh, we will okay. Um, I'm afraid <laughs> I will not be able to do that. Okay. Uh, so um country to country visits were a very good opportunity for all of us to uh, see how other countries created and realized their national action plans and to share experience with implementation of national strategies uh, in may 2019 we had privilege to host the visit uh, of colleagues from france uh, in september we had a great pleasure to visit italy uh, both visits enabled to evaluate the impact of national program for antibiotic protection, which started in Poland in 2010, on infection prevention in Poland. Uh, this program, among other tasks, had preparation of the treatment and diagnostic guidelines for medical professionals, as well as antibiotic stewardship guidelines for infection control teams in hospital. Uh, this together with the appropriate legislation in the field of infection prevention in hospitals were evaluated as the best practice to share with an EMRI. Uh, in uh, Poland, uh, the priority is to strengthen the governance and coordination between sectors and to publish the first national strategy. As till now, some work was done separately in the veterinary and health sector, but we hope to have also the third sector and environmental involved. I hope next month will bring visible progress on building the national strategy. Uh, this year, new national health program will start with the infection infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance recognized as one of the major topics. This means the continuation of the most of the activities of the National Program for Antibiotic Protection. So this program, which was already in place in the health sector uh, from previous years, but also the possibility to plan other products dedicated to understanding of antimicrobial resistance on all levels, surveillance, education and awareness raising. Those activities should be included in the national action plan. Uh, first such action is ongoing, the appointment of the National Reference Center for Antimicrobial Resistance with adequate funding, which will start uh, in 2021. This function will be fulfilled by my laboratory, the National Reference Center for Susceptibility Testing. The second priority, as you can see, for improvement was what uh, was um, the prudent use of antibiotics this was recognized during country to country visits uh, in both uh, with both um, countries uh, first step to monitor the antibiotic use in primary sector on national level and to monitor the adherence to national guidelines was done with implementing in 2020 the electronic prescription in health sector. First set of data obtained using this system will be available for analysis this year. So country to country visits were excellent opportunity to show the importance of building the national strategy to policymakers, and we hope we will be able to construct really good national strategy. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you all the team which was involved in Poland, uh, Professor Valeria Hryniewicz and my colleague uh, Anna Ortak-Pinkowska, who is working in the same department as myself, and also uh, Monika Glanowska from Ministry of Health, who was supporting us in uh, all the activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorota, and uh, thank you also Michela for presenting uh, the, the experiences of uh, two countries of the 13 that participated in this country to country visits. And I think it's great to see that uh, the visits have provided uh, some 
tools to, to move ahead and to improve the implementation of the national action plans at national level. But uh, before we go, we get underway to the next part of the session, which is the round table. Uh, let us find out how, what do you think about some topics that are also has also been mentioned by Dorota and by uh, Michaela. And to, we will do this by means of a couple of online questions, a kind of quiz. And uh, you uh, don't need to, to have uh, any tools just to, to push the question that, uh, that uh, or the answer to the question that you think is more relevant in your case. So if we can go, this will be for short questions and uh, then we will comment on it. Um, please, if we can go to the first question. Yes, we have here the first question of the of the quiz is now in your screen. So you only need to use your mouse or to touch on the answer. The first question is which are the priority areas of work in your country? So the ones that you think that still needs uh, some work. Uh, and you max select uh, maximal two areas of work. So please go ahead. You had 15 seconds to answer it. Yeah, I think 15 seconds passed. Has everybody have the time to do it? So let's go to the results. Surveillance is one of the most uh, voted. We have also followed by One Health and Prudent Use. And uh, this seems to be less is uh, voted, has been supervision and governance coordination. Okay, let's go to the second question. We will comment later on these questions. The second question is about uh, how is organized in your country supervision and control or enforcement uh, about the measures uh, put in place by the National Action Plan in the human sector. So you have an organization for it. Uh, you have more than one organization. You don't have in your country organization in charge of supervision or you don't know. Yeah the results. In most of the countries, it seems that they have one organization. In some countries, there are two, but there is still uh, some participants that don't know about the situation in their own country. And just few countries don't have 9% of the respondents say that in their own country, there is no organization in charge of um, responsible for control or enforcement. Okay, let's go now to the third question. That is very easy. Are you familiar with the work of the One Health Network? Oh, here is very similar the answers the half a little bit more than the half is uh, aware about the work and is uh, has is familiar with the work of the one health network and the other half 
says no. Okay, let's go now to the last question. And this is about how can the One Health Network contribute to improve national action plans and the implementation, of course, of these national action plans. I don't see the need of support of the One Health uh, Network towards national action plans. The platform, uh, this, uh, um, the network can be a platform for a change of good practices of a uh, subgroup for discussion panels. And in this case, you can only vote for one. It seems that the majority thinks that the platform for exchange of good practices is uh, is the most voted uh, answer. Okay, uh, so thanks for all these answers. And uh, we will comment the answers uh, of the quiz in a minute, uh, but let's first move to the into the round table and introduce our speakers today in this round table. So uh, our speakers are uh, Michaela and Dorota, that you already know, she, she, I, we have here her uh, uh, during uh, the first part of this session. But we have also here today Robin and uh, Andrea. Uh, I will start with Robin because we have also uh, seen Robin during the introductory video. Robin is a scientific, has a scientific background as biochemist and with a, and holds a PhD in medicine, but he changed his uh, scientific background to move into policy and is now working uh, currently as senior inspector at the Health and Dutch Care Inspectorate, in the, the, uh, which is a department of the Ministry of Health in the Netherlands. Uh, welcome, uh, Robin. And our other speaker today is Andrea Gavinelli. Uh, Andrea is the head of uh, unit G5 Animal Welfare and Antimicrobial Resistance at DG Sante. Andrea is a veterinarian and has been dealing with several strategic and policy initiatives in the area of animal health and, well, uh, and welfare, first at the Ministry of Health in Rome and since 1999 at the European Commission. Uh, most recently, he has been involved in the European Fact to Fork strategy and is now dealing with a unit dedicated to animal welfare and to the coordination of the activities related to the fight of antimicrobial resistance, including the management on the, of the One Health Network. Thanks, Andrea, for having accepted to be part of the panel today. And uh, let's start with uh, the first question that we have posed to the, to, the, to the participants, which was about the areas, uh, the areas that uh, needs to be uh, or can be emphasized during the, the, the work or needs improvement still at national level. And if I uh, go back to the results, I see that uh, the majority, about 47%, uh, mentioned surveillance. And I will go back first to Michaela and see uh, you have also uh, been part of the country to go to visits. You have been presented the results of, uh, of Italy. What do you feel about these uh, answers uh, on the quiz? Are reflecting also the situation in Italy? Uh, yes, it is. It reflects uh, well the situation in Italy because, uh, for example, we um, our um, one of our priorities is for the, for healthcare associates over time in Italy and only involves uh, some hospitals currently. Um, uh, as well as uh, the um, one health approach, uh, we ha we have been um, uh, we are uh, improving the one health approach, uh, including the uh, env environmental sector, 
in the national in the next national action plan uh, which is already present in the actual nap but will be implemented um, in the in the next one so we are in line with the most of the, of the answers Okay, but uh, for it, I think that for for Poland is a slightly different because I, in in your presentation you put governance as one of the of the key elements, uh, and uh, here in the in the answers today, governance was uh, not uh, not uh, so high in numbers. What do you think about it? Why in Poland? Could be different, you think, to, to these results? Uh, yes, uh, for sure, the governance and coordination are the priorities for Poland uh, because we are still working to create our national strategy. So this is something which is really uh, on the on the top of the priorities. Um, we have already cooperation uh, with uh, people from veterinary and uh, other people from health sectors. Uh, so we know each other, we have some ideas, we exchange them, but uh, what was urgently needed is the political uh, willingness to recognize the antimicrobial resistance as one of the major health problems in Poland and uh, the political commitment to appoint the formal committee which will work on the national strategy. We need a committee which will gather all stakeholders from health, from veterinary um, sector, from environment, professionals, scientific societies, other relevant stakeholders, and uh, to have the committee which will have the mandate to prepare the final document for approval for acceptance by the government. So this is the priority for us. Of course, surveillance too. Uh, still, we need to build uh, the really good system. Uh, but I think this is missing uh, for all our, our countries that we want to have something which will be better organized. Thank you, Dorota. And uh, let's move to the to the second question that this was about the about the Super, uh, supervision and enforcement and in the results we saw that um, most of the respondents say that yes they have a national level one or more organizations uh, in charge of it and i will uh, go uh, to robin to put this question back because i think that i i think that you were not expecting these results if i i uh, because during the the during the joint action uh, work, we had uh, different uh, issues about this uh, topic. Can you explain a little bit how it was? Well, good morning, Rosa. <clears throat> I'm indeed happy to see that uh, um, almost all participants know that there is one supervisory body in, uh, in their country. Uh, what we indeed saw during the meetings is that supervision is organized very differently among member states and it can be governmental oversight or it can be supervision but also in many countries professional societies are involved in monitoring or having the control over uh, various issues regarding AMR and um, it was our challenge indeed to to bring back or to bring together all these differences um, um, under one term and and we chose uh, supervision for that term but it's uh, it's a range of activities among uh, among member states yeah. and uh, robin uh, what uh, can you also explain us what is the added value of inspection and supervision on the implementation of national action plans what why is so important to have a good control or supervision activities well we in the netherlands we, we have one organization uh, uh, that deals with uh, supervision on amr or the implementation of the national action plans and in the past years i, I can give you an example in the past years um, we worked together with a number of professional uh, associations uh, that were involved in setting guidelines for, for instance, prudent use of antibiotics. And over the years, um, 
mainly these organizations were able to successfully introduce antibiotic stewardship in hospitals. And um, because we were in close collaboration, uh, we as an inspector were always in the background um, um, watching and monitoring the implementation of the stewardship. And um, it's good that the professionals do that themselves and they did the larger part of the work. But we, in the end, have the mandate to, um, well, to strongly advise or to enforce that hospitals or other institution, uh, institutions comply to the guidelines. So this collaboration with uh, all the stakeholders involved, including government like supervision and the professional societies is, is key, I think. Thank you, Robin. And let's move now to, to the last two questions of the, of the quiz that were about the One Health Network and, uh, and the results showing that 50-50, uh, more or less, some of the participants are not uh, very much, uh, uh, doesn't know a lot about the One Health Network. But if we go to the second question that I think that is uh, really the most interesting is about uh, what can, uh, how can we use uh, much better the, the One Health Network as a platform to exchange best practices. So Andrea, um, you are uh, the, the head of unit of the, of the unit at DG Sante that is in charge of the One Health Network. So please, what, what uh, can you explain us about the One Health Network and how can contribute to, to this for this purpose? Yes. <clears throat> So thank you very much, first of all, for, uh, for this uh, event and the capacity to be an opportunity to be here. And um, in fact, uh, I pick up the role of coordinating this in the, in the full of a pandemic uh, era. And um, with a stop in the One Health Network that happened more than one year ago. So it was a good occasion and opportunity to reflect uh, not only uh, between uh, ourselves, but with the full of the commission uh, directorates. And uh, we are uh, uh, having uh, more and more uh, information like the one of today, that uh, a platform uh, where a, a possible exchange and a capacity to uh, guide uh, the different approaches and uh, it is quite uh, demanded. Uh, we see the two main uh, events uh, came in in the last period uh, that uh, motivate us to sit and reflect uh, around a common table. And these are in fact uh, one, uh, of course, what happened with the COVID and the situation we had to face. Uh, second, uh, the effect that the commission adopted a farm to four strategy in which uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have a central role of food system in terms of preserving the sustainability of uh, what is the area of uh, food production connected with health. So the concept uh, of uh, human and animal health came even stronger. As a consequence, uh, the situation is not only a situation where we could profit of a place where all member states are sitting together and could be coordinating, uh, but in addition, it should be considered how uh, civil society and uh, of course uh, uh, private organization could be able to contribute to this process so to how we can tailor made this in a way to profit of these synergies as you have had in this important project still the project is in fact limited to few member states and that uh, ambition is instead to get exactly the european union in the pay in the, in the same rhythm and pace on that and uh, last but not least uh, uh, a common platform, uh, uh, the more will be known, the more will be capable to uh, inspire and, and make uh, this plan converging to the common target, the more will be visible at the international level. So to reinforce global capacity, that is essential. So we are on a new start. We fixed a meeting in a few weeks, actually of the 1L network, the first one after uh, one more than one year of silence, as I said, between brackets. This will be an opportunity to 
reflect together and came hopefully on conclusion on the future. Uh, and we believe strongly that uh, as I learned also from other platforms like the animal welfare platform, for example, that started four years ago in a very concrete uh, setup uh, with more than 50 hosts uh, between member state and private and civil society, we could inspire and we could lead uh, even a global level. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, thank you for sharing this information about the, the, the One Health Network and uh, happy to hear that uh, despite still the situation is not optimal, uh, you are going to restart uh, the One Health Network. I think that is a very good uh, uh, issue. Uh, as you may know, uh, and has been said, uh, one of the outcomes of the JAMRA is the need between member states to, to, to have uh, more possibilities to interact, to, to, to share experience, and, uh, and uh, also as reflected in, the, in this uh, small quiz, that was also the main issue that, uh, that countries uh, think that, that could be uh, of added value for the One Health Network. Um, just uh, we are running out of time. I hear that we are more than five minutes light. But um, so uh, I think we can stop here. Just summarizing this, this, uh, this um, that that this uh, has been a very good experience uh, for all member states participating. And uh, one of the important things is this sustainability. And in this context, I think that the One Health Network can be also uh, an important uh, tool to ensure that uh, the, the actions that has been started uh, can also uh, be sustained through the One Health Network, for example. And this is also important for the, for the, for the network of supervisory bodies. I don't know, Andrea, if you have also been thinking about it, how the network of supervisory bodies can be sustained, if it's a possibility to have uh, some discussions on it at the One Health Network? Sure. Yes, that's, that's an important element. In fact, uh, the door is open to see how <clears throat> what is a punctual meeting uh, twice per year could become really a permanent capacity of networking, not only between the supervisory, bo supervisory bodies, but in fact, uh, uh, we, have, we are not forgetting, uh, as I repeat, the role uh, of uh, different directorate general, the connection with the environment, the connection with research and so on, uh, even agriculture. So as a consequence, uh, this uh, network uh, should definitely be embedded in this uh, synergy that we have, like in the Green Deal. Uh, you mentioned it, and I'm not surprised of the result of the quiz, as I say, because um, uh, the a showcasing event could be, this is my idea, we are debating inside and we have to discuss with our uh, commissioner also, but in fact, uh, uh, a showcasing event is important, yes, but what is more important is a proactive event that we could have in terms of a network. So to translate this project into a reality of an ongoing and continuing process. So the supervisory bodies are ser seriously an important representation of, uh, of the reality that should be connected stronger. Thank you for these uh, uh, comments. And I, I think that we have to close now. Thank you to all the panelists today. Thank you to the, all the members of the World Package Fight that has been working on this uh, the country to country visits and on the interviews for the, for the establishment of the One Health Network. And uh, I will also thank uh, the French uh, team uh, uh, for the coordination and the Spanish team to, that has been uh, providing the videos and, uh, and, uh, and all the coordination of this session. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, back to Stadika for uh, the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. What a fascinating discussion on our common goals for health priority. Thank you, everyone. With a strong European network, we are building a better future for citizen health. It's time for a short coffee break. 
stretch your legs, have a cup of coffee, tea. We will come back at 10.45. Let me welcome Laura Alonso and Maria Santa Creu, the EU Jumarai Communication Specialist from the Spanish Agency of Medicine and Medical Devices and her invited speakers. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sadika. Uh, good morning, dear guests. It is a great pleasure to be here presenting our results and closing up a great, a great project. Communication is often seen as a cross-sectoral area that supports other working areas, but it's more than that. We strongly believe that it should be programmatic. Making communication a cornerstone of all national action plans will really make an impact on the reduction of AMR. During the past three years, the communication team has had a clear general objective. We wanted to implement concrete actions at EU level, evaluate their impact, and share our, our experience with all EU member states. Now, let's see a video that summarizes EU GEMRI key results to raise awareness and promote behavior change. One of the main objectives of EU JAMRAI has been to increase awareness on antimicrobial resistance, promoting the responsible use of antibiotics and encouraging healthy habits among different target audiences. After delivering a social behaviour change communication strategy based on a global approach, EU JAMRAI started the design and implementation of several dynamic activities. The objective has been taking the global issue of AMR and making it meaningful to society at a local level. For doing so, the support of EU JAMRAI partners designing and implementing the following raising awareness activities has been crucial. Don't Leave It Halfway is a video series of four announcements. With a touch of humour, the key message highlights the importance of following the prescription given by the healthcare professional. Available in 18 languages, the online campaign was launched to celebrate 2018 European Antibiotic Awareness Day and reached 2.7 million people in one month. The AMR webinar for journalists is an online training opportunity with clear and accurate scientific information from senior tutors with long experience in the fight against AMR. We had the privilege to have senior tutors from EU Jamrai, ECDC and FAO. The topics of the webinar cover the impact of AMR in human health and animal health, the ways in which Europe is facing this global health challenge and the important role of the media. In 2018, EU Jamrai ran a social media listening to find out what was being said about the antimicrobial resistance on the internet. One of the main conclusions was that the concept One Health was not being used. EU Jamrai designed the social media campaign One Health Butterfly Effect to raise awareness about this complex concept. The One Health approach recognizes that human health, animal health and environment are interconnected. Efforts by just one sector are not enough to tackle antimicrobial resistance. We need to design and implement policies, programs and research in which multiple sectors are working together. However, this mission can be seen as a very overwhelming task. Under the claim, everybody can flap their wings to create a One Health butterfly effect, the audience was engaged, highlighting that we all have a role to play and that individual small changes can have large effects. Specific posts with attractive images and short key messages were created for different target audiences on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook and widely disseminated with the support of our stakeholders and partners. Given the complexity of introducing antibiotic resistance in the curricular programme of schools, EU Jamrai decided to develop the game app MicroCombat to facilitate 
that the subject is treated during school hours. Based on the card game developed by the IS Global Research Institute, Micro Combat App is available in 19 languages and allows users to play remotely with people from their own environment or from anywhere in the world. Designed for 10 years old players and older, it allows introducing what types of pathogens we are exposed to, how we can prevent the spread of infectious diseases, and how much more effective preventing is than the subsequent treatment of diseases, or what antimicrobial resistance is. The magic of this game is that kids learn while playing and having fun. Firstly, they learn science, and secondly, since it is a cooperative game, they learn to be better citizens, because they experience that some threats can only be tackled by working together. EU Jamrai called to action individuals from all over the world and organised a contest to find the first global antibiotic resistance symbol. Something tangible that anyone, anywhere, can make at home and wear with pride, like the AIDS red ribbon. The contest generated a lot of discussion in social media, reaching over 600,000 people and got 600 applications from 44 countries. A multi-sectoral jury with members from several organisations involved in the fight against AMR selected the design of David Jungberg. Jungberg is a Swedish product designer and art director with multiple awards for his work in advertising. He now specialises in user-focused design that bridges the communication gap between science and the general public. The concept of the antibiotic resistance symbol is very simple. Two hearts slide together, turning into an X shape made of antibiotic pills. The capsules set the theme. The hearts tell us we need to care and the band-aids tell us there is something to fix. The winning symbol was launched to celebrate the 2020 European Antibiotic Awareness Day. Um, thanks to a strong digital campaign, we reached uh, almost 2 million people in only the first two months. The campaign has had a remarkable impact on Twitter, where many organisations and personalities supported the initiative, sharing pictures wearing the symbol. The response was very positive from the beginning, but this is a long distance race. There are not quick wins when promoting behavior change. Now we have to keep going and we need the support of all member states and stakeholders to popularize the use of this great symbol. In order to ensure the sustainability of these activities, we have developed a plan to integrate them within national policies. EU Jamai has also developed a toolkit to guide countries and partners in their efforts to raise awareness of, on AMR, collecting all the results and lessons learned by the communication team. We cannot underestimate that promoting behaviour change is our biggest challenge. We need to find ways to engage all sectors of society and ensure that they feel part of the solution because we all have a role to play in the fight against AMA. As explained in the video, the support of our partners and stakeholders in the design and implementation of our campaigns has been key for their success. Today, some of our stakeholders are joining this event to explain how they have supported it to Jamrai. We will start with John Kinsman, behavior change expert from ECDC. John cannot join us today, but he has kindly sent us a recorder speech. Let's watch the video. Good morning and thank you very much for the uh, chance to speak with you at your final dissemination conference. My name is John Kinsman, uh, working with ECDC. Um, and I just want to say that it has been a pleasure to have the chance to work with EU Jamrai 
over the last 15 months or so since I was invited to um, support a very nice qualitative research project looking at antimicrobial stewardship programs in the member states. And uh, it was a very nice uh, way of getting to know colleagues at EU JAMRAI and also um, the, the, within the member states who were doing the work. Um, that was very nice. I also had the honor and the privilege of, of contributing to the um, AMR symbol uh, selection, which uh, was very nice. I was very happy with the result there. I think that um, one of the problems we've had with AMR has been that there is no uh, sort of internationally recognized brand or iconic feature which we can all uh, recognize. With uh, climate change, we have the polar bear or we have Greta Thunberg. With HIV AIDS, we have the red ribbon. And now we have this for AMR. And I hope that this will become something that people can really focus on uh, in the future, I think it's an incredibly important visual identity for this issue, which is definitely not going away. I think over the last year, we have um, suffered with COVID very extensively, um, and many people have forgotten about the other pathogens, which have not actually gone to sleep and stopped their, 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 their work. Um, so it's important that we sustain the focus on AMR. And I hope that in that process, there will be the opportunity to continue with um, building behavioral insights research capacity and sustaining that and strengthening that. And also that um, qualitative research capacity will be also built there. So we can look at the whys and the hows of issues to do with um, people's behavior and antimicrobial resistance. Um, so uh, I really congratulate you for, your, for all your work. Um, thank you for the opportunity to contribute, and I wish you all the very, very best. Thank you. Very nice words from John. We have been very lucky to have his experience and support. And now let's listen to Mariana Borrell from the International Federation of Medical Students Association. Welcome, Mariana. Hello everyone and thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, my name is Mariona and I represent uh, the European region uh, in the IFMSA, the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, and we've been collaborating with EU JAMRAI for uh, quite some time. Uh, AMR is one of the core focus areas that the IFMSA works on and it is the primary priority for the IFMSA's European region. And in the past years of collaboration, uh, IFA, IFMSA organized a panel discussion on AMR at the YoFest in the European Commission um, with the European Pharmaceutical Students Association and the International Veterinary Students Association as well. Uh, the panel discussed youth engagement and inclusion in fighting against AMR, the One Health approach and the need for collaboration in acting against AMR. The IFMSA is also one of the civil society organizations to have given input in the European Commission on the One Health Action Plan on antimicrobial resistance and uh, also participated in the WHO expert consultation meeting on health workforce education and AMR uh, risk control in 2017 and continues to be committed to achieving the goals on the WHO uh, global action plan on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, with our 140 national member organizations from 130 countries, we encourage them to uh, organize national campaigns on AMR and throughout the World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week held last fall, uh, IFMSA equipped its members with the tools and resources to create awareness campaigns and advocacy actions against AMR. Also, the IFMSA members adopted a policy document on AMR uh, back in 2017 and also renovated last year during um, our latest General Assembly to incorporate the newest data. Uh, IFMSA, we believe that educating healthcare providers on appropriate uh, antimicrobial use is key in reducing resistance and IFMSA has been taking act an active role in promoting awareness about antimicrobial resistant, resistance in Europe and in the world. 
And we have been supporting EU jam rights efforts over the past years, uh, most recently promoting the micro combat game app among our members, uh, as well as sharing um, EU jam rights campaigns to amplify their reach, especially through our national and local committees where we believe we uh, achieve uh, the real impact. Um, and lastly, just uh, thank you again for inviting us and we look forward to our future collaborations. Thank you, Mariana. You represent the future healthcare workforce. It's extremely important to have you on board. Uh, okay, we will continue with Anders Beres from the Joint Programming Initiative on Antimicrobial Resistance. Hi, Anders. Welcome. Uh, please, you can proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, we have much work to do together and we have done much as well. Um, um, since you know, uh, JPA Marius, uh, we have much in common. Uh, JPA Marius is a member based organization. We have 28 countries uh, together with us and we uh, have a focus on coordinating uh, research uh, funding and uh, research uh, priorities on a global scale. Uh, and we're much happy to be collaborating with you. Uh, coming up soon is a virtual workshop on uh, AMR surveillance uh, research and its impact on policymaking, uh, 23rd of February, uh, where we engage mm. in key stakeholders uh, together. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to do that together with you, continuing the work to uh bring awareness and uh, more uh, beyond us also you've been inspiring us i think uh throughout the years uh with the videos and all, all the engagement work you've done uh we've been participating contributing to the the uh, things you've been doing uh sharing information uh inspiration activation i think um you have made us better uh, because you have inspired us Um, and we're continuing to do that work together as well. Uh, is it enough? Uh, well, we have the grand challenge to curb AMR on a global scale. Uh, we are not finished with the work we're doing together. Um, the only thing we need is to keep collaborating, uh, keep listening, uh, keep engaging. Uh, but I firmly believe that we are better together. Uh, so thank you for everything you've done, and I look forward to work together with you uh, for the coming weeks and the future. Thank you, Anders. Yes, we, indeed, we are stronger together. Now it is the turn of this Pony Ayatridu from the European Platform for the Responsible Use of Medicine in Animals. This Pony the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, and uh, thank you for this invitation on behalf of EP Roma, which I said is the European platform for the responsible use of medicines in animals. We are a multi-stakeholder group bringing together veterinarians, farmers, the animal health industry, feed manufacturers and national initiatives. Ipiruma has been raising awareness on the need for responsible use of all medicines for more than 15 years. We enthusiastically joined this action since the beginning as we share the same objectives, that is to facilitate one health best practices exchange against IMR and to contribute to the discussion among policymakers. We joined initially at the uh, working package seven, which was working on appropriate use of antimicrobials in humans and animals, where we contributed to the collection of field data from farmers and veterinarians in two surveys. One in 2018, searching to identify best practices in the responsible use of veterinary antibiotics at national level, and one next year regarding implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs. Ipiruma also contributed to the work of the Working Package 4 with input on the priorities for the joint action. There, the animal health sector highlighted the need for a true One Health approach to ensure sustainability of the outcomes. 
during these three and a half years, we have been following and spreading the EU GAMRA campaigns, such as the One Health Butterfly Effect, the uh, campaign Don't Leave It Halfway, and the IMR Symbol Contest. We contributed to all previous annual discussions, like we do today, by highlighting the contribution of the animal health sector to responsible use of medicines and One Health a contribution that has led to the decrease of antibiotic sales in food producing animals by 34% over the past 10 years. Two weeks ago, Ipiruma has endorsed the recommendation developed in collaboration with EU GAMRE, calling for the development of core competencies on antimicrobial stewardship for farmers, and we will continue to share the outcomes of this joint action via our channels. Thank you again for being part of this. Uh, big project. Thank you, thank you, Svina. We finished with Jay Tassi from the communication team of the One Health European Joint Program. Great supporters of EU Jam right from the very beginning and authors of the greatest pictures wearing the antibiotic resistance symbol. I encourage you to check it in social media. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Jay, please. Thank you very much, Laura. So good morning um, and thank you for inviting us today. Um, I'm Jay Passy and I'm a member of the One Health European Joint Programme communications team. We are a consortium of 37 partners across 19 countries in the EU with a One Health focus on foodborne zoonosis, antimicrobial resistance and emerging threats. EU JAMRI and the One Health EJP have had a strong relationship for many years and representatives of our management teams and communication teams have worked closely on lots of dissemination activities. We have also become valued members of each other's stakeholder committees. A key way that we have supported EU JAMRI is through our digital platforms. Over the years, there have been several social media campaigns we have collaborated on, including One Health Day, European Antibiotic Awareness Day and World Antibiotic Awareness Week. We have also supported social media campaigns led by EU JAMRI, including the One Health Butterfly Effect, uh, the Don't Leave It Halfway social media campaign and the Antibiotic Awareness Symbol. We were able to get many of our consortium members to wear the symbol from our project management team right down to our PhD students. Um, and as Laura mentioned, we were also able to bake and knit the symbol. The possibilities were endless and we were able to sh show that um, and that reflected the vision of um, EU JAMRI when they uh, started up this campaign. Um, and of course, it's so nice to see so many people wearing the symbol today. We were kindly asked to judge the entries of the competition, uh, which uh, for me personally was an honour, um, and each and every symbol was cleverly considered and well executed, and the UJAMRI were able to open up the creative side of scientists, which is always welcomed. More recently, we have shared the news of the MicroCombat app with our followers and our consortium members on Twitter and LinkedIn, and that's been very well received and widely shared. Additionally, we plan to use our website as a hub for some of their policy briefs to support the dissemination and promote the sustainability of EU JAMRI's work over the last three and a half years. We've also supported EU JAMRI through our newsletters and bulletins, and we've been able to share their social media campaigns and also any events and interesting news from their consortium, which have been of interest to, to all of our members. We will, of course, continue to share many of these initiatives in the coming months and years to ensure that EU JAMRI's legacy lives on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jade. Uh, before we continue, we would like to remind you that all lessons learned by the communication team are summarized on a toolkit for communication and behavior change on AMR that is available in our website. This toolkit is the best way that we have found to make all these activities available to EU national action plans and scale up their impact. Now we are going to start in a few minutes with the round table. And I'm going to briefly start introducing our following speakers. Let's wait a minute to make sure that we are seeing our speakers of the round table. <clears throat> there you are. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we are delighted to
to welcome Charles Price from DG Santé, Danilo Fogong from WHO, Dominique Monet from ECDC, Sasha Marchand from the European Public Health Alliance, and Jens de Gret from the European Union of Science Journalists Association. Welcome all. So our first question is for Dominique and Danilo. Every year, the ad and the World Antibiotic Awareness Week engage different target audiences in the fight against antibiotic resistance. You support countries providing evidence and producing high quality communication materials and key messages. In your opinion, what else needs to be done to ensure that countries benefit from the big communication efforts done by ECDC and WHO? Thank you want to start, Dominique? I can, oh, start. I can start. Good morning. Um, we're in the times of, of COVID. So I've been reading lately and reading books. And to my surprise, it's already in the 1950s and 60s. We were talking about bacterial resistance rather than AMR. We we're talking about rational use or prudent use rather than antimicrobial stewardship. And the issues of raising awareness of the general public and, and health professionals were already mentioned. The term Superberg dates back to 1966. In some European countries, I'm talking about Czechoslovakia at the time and also Denmark and Sweden, the efforts can be traced as far back as 1960-1970s. In the EU, you can see efforts in the late 1990s and early 2000s with a first strategy published in 2001 and already in one health perspective. And all this has accelerated during the past decade and the many initiatives that were reported in, in this session already illustrate this point. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to continue. Obviously, we've not done enough. It's a snowball effect. We start seeing uh, in uh, an increasing number of member states that are reporting data to ECC and are showing a decrease in antimicrobial consumption and the first sign of a possible effect on antimicrobial resistance. So let's continue. And I think one thing done enough is to invest in raising awareness of antimicrobial resistance and antibiotics among school children and young adults and about antibiotics and also hygiene and possibly other public health issues. Uh, the initiative of a macro combat uh, uh, cards and, uh, and uh, app is certainly a good one. There's also the eBug program and uh, I would say we, we need to save eBug. We need to find a home for eBug and we need to continue with eBug. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Now I will I will pick up where uh, where Dominique left off, and, and you're absolutely right. It's it's been it's been debated and brought up many times over the past uh, many years. I think the first um, meeting minutes I found in WHO was uh, a meeting in 1971 on the topic, and then you can actually you can see how slow this uh, this has been uh, developing in terms of of local and global awareness. Um, and there's there's been uh, I think the eu and eu member states have been really up on the forefront of of pushing the agenda and and doing something about it actually um so a little bit later who also came on board for to to get the rest of the region engaged and since 2014 we've been encouraging countries to share awareness campaign plans with us and we provided them with very small grants to help them realize those plans because especially in countries that had very little experience in setting up amr campaigns Usually just the lack of funds was a major barrier to get even started on the smallest events. Um, and what we've seen is that actually a lot can be done with a little. And uh, as the years went by, we see more and more innovation also in these countries that are relatively new to awareness campaigns and, uh, and finding ways to complete the materials that ECDC and us have provided to them. So I think we see an increased ownership of the awareness day and the awareness week. And I think moving forward, we need to look beyond one day or one week per year and find ways to support countries to raise awareness all year round. And I think if anything we've learned from COVID-19 is that people can actually change behavior once they realize the gravity of the situation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Danilo and Dominique. The following question goes to Charles. Countries often are not having enough resources to make communication a cornerstone of their national action plans. From the policy making point of view, what else could be done at EU level to support countries in their communication efforts? Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, good morning and good morning to everybody on the call. And can I just start by saying how wonderful it is to hear of the achievements of the JAMRAI and actually also your achievements on communication. You know, with all the stakeholders on the call, with the new symbol, with the way that you're reaching out to people all over Europe, it's fantastic. So the first answer to your question, then, I think we need to have more projects like Jam Rye. And we can hopefully look at our new EU for Health programme and see how we can support this effort and build on your achievements. Of course, the EU's got a couple of things that it uh, must do in its action plan. We've said that we'll help support member states to understand better public awareness on this issue through Eurobarometers. And so we will carry on doing that. And we, shouldn't, uh, we, sh we should use those resources. But I'd also like to point to the ECDC's uh, Eurobarometer for professionals. It's not just reaching out to the public, but reaching out to our stakeholders in the veterinary and the medical stakeholders who then have an enormous influence with their clients. And the ECDC survey showed that many of the professionals actually could do with some more support to help them communicate the message. And finally, on World Antibiotic Awareness Week, colleagues were just talking about that. Again, I would like to see us looking at EU for Health to see if we could do more to support maybe common materials which could be then taken forward uh, by member states in national languages to, to reach out during that whole week uh, using the social media, using more effectively and using television and other public awareness tools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles, for your kind words and for being always there supporting us. Uh, actually, yes, let's let's hope that we can have more projects like that to, to keep the, the collective effort up. Um, so now the next question is for Sasha. Uh, Sasha, EPA's goal for 2020 was to make sure that the public health objectives and the reduction of health inequalities were mainstream through all relevant EU policies and programs. Which are your proposals to get the EMR become mainstream, not only for policymakers, but also for the population? Yeah, thank you for the question and good morning to everyone. I hope you can hear me all right and that I'm not just a dark shape. I'm trying to get the light right, but somehow. It's okay. <laughs> <It's not> okay. <laughs> um, so the European Public Health Alliance, first of all, um, is a large uh, public health umbrella organization. So we're not a patient organization. We're not a healthcare professional uh, lobby. We're not uh, only representing the uh, interests of vulnerable groups, but it's really the diversity of the public health uh, community. And I think that puts us in an interesting uh, position to um, disseminate the results of the GEMRI, both vis-a-vis uh, -vis policymakers, and that obviously combined with our own uh, activities in the policy sphere. Um, just to highlight a couple of them, the most important ones for the last couple of years have been the coordination of the AMR stakeholder network, which um, was originally created under the European Health Policy Platform, but then became its own um, sort of stakeholder network, really bringing together a much wider uh, selection of stakeholders, civil society led. Uh, which has created its own roadmap. And then in addition to this, we're also working very closely with the MEP Fight AMR uh, interest group as uh, co-coordinators of, of that group. So stakeholder network and MEP interest group are closely linked. In terms of communication, uh, general public versus policymakers, I think the general public needs to be always uh, uh, addressed because I think every generation needs to learn about the dangers of the AMR, AMR um, anew. So while we are now creating a lot more awareness, 
the next generation will need exactly the same, just how it is when it comes to the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases or communicable diseases, for example. And I think this, this uh, symbol is a great thing because it, it makes things just a little bit more visible and understandable than just talking about statistics. The other thing I want to say is I think that the pandemic crisis well, unfortunately, but fortunately in this context, it has really raised awareness of um, individual responsibility as well, and also the benefits of very simple actions. So it's raised our awareness of hand hygiene, for example, um, at the hospital setting of infection prevention and control measures and these kinds of things. And I think it's hugely important um, in the future if we want to talk about AMR because I felt that temporarily and for very good reasons the AMR discussion was a little bit sidelined and now that awareness has been raised again and if John Ryan said it twice recently in public settings you know like the AMR crisis is just around the corner so we really need to wake up and take action um, and perhaps the final point in terms of mainstreaming this into the conversation EFA being so broad, we, we obviously want to help the Commission with the implementation, not only of the EU for Health strategy itself, but also with a lot of the flagship um, priorities and initiatives, whether it's Europe's Beating Cancer Plan, um, the Farm to Fork strategy, the pharmaceutical strategy, um, actions on health inequalities, and AMR, the AMR angle can be brought into all of these conversations and must be brought into all of these conversations. And I think that's where hopefully we can, we can play a really useful role in this. And we look forward to also hosting all of your useful documents on our website. Thank you very much, Jens. Um, now uh, we are going to follow with Jens. Sasha, thank you very much. Jens, what could the general media do to convey scientific information on AMR more effectively and comprehensively to the public? Oh, thank you for inviting me. And, uh, and I can tell you there's a lot to do. Um, first of all, um, if if you want to uh, communicate complex messages, you have to address the practitioners. And, and I also think that, uh, that uh, you have to find out which are the journalists and which part of the press would be the best part to communicate uh, these relatively complex messages. I also think that there are some general messages which are important, but in order to make changes uh, you have you have to also explain why is antibiotic resistance resistance uh, important and um, after doing that i would also say uh, you need to have a very uh, national based um, communication so you are aware that that you cannot give the same messages in Denmark as you can in Sweden, because uh, they will look different at, um, at the uh, information in Sweden than they look in Denmark. And the problems are different. For example, in my country, we have a huge uh, production of uh, livestock and, and pigs. I think there's about five times more pigs in my country than there are humans. And, and they use enormous amount of antibiotic. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot to do uh, in order to inform uh, the press and also inform the stakeholders uh, which are organizing uh, the journalists and the press. Uh, uh, I think this is a very important issue. And I can also say that there's a lot of interest in uh, in covering the topic whenever i have uh, put articles or raised uh, issues about antibiotic resistance uh, and and i was running actually uh, four seminars uh, last year on that topic that has been a lot of interest in this so um, so i think uh, it's it's uh, kicking in open doors, uh, but you also have to be specific and be aware that it's uh, different messages you should communicate in different countries and to different stakeholders. So it's uh, I would say it's a 
very important topic to communicate, but you also have to be aware of the complexity of both the topic itself, but also in communicating it. I hope I hope that gave you an, an impression of um, of how I I see it and um, and how um, how I think that um, that you can address the issue uh, in a multi-stakeholder multi uh, country area as as we have here in, in in Europe. Yes, definitely. We have a global challenge, but uh, we have to adapt the the messages uh, to the local context uh, because you know realities are very different across the different countries. Um, uh, dear round table members, uh, we had more questions prepared. We will be here longer uh, uh, chatting with you but unfortunately we are a little bit late we are running late and i think that we have to to close uh, this session and, and move to the next one uh, thank you so much uh, for for your participation and for the support that you have given us along the life of eu jam uh, hoping to see you soon thank you very much thank you you're welcome thank you Thank you. Thank you. What an inspiring or the first session and discussion. Thank you everyone for joining us. To combat the rising threat of EMR, therefore requires global concerted action. A multi-sectoral approach and commitment of everyone. EMR is not the sole issue of doctors. It challenges patients, health authorities, research, policymakers, stakeholders. We are all part of the solution. Christina is from the Spanish Agency of Medicine and Medical Devices, and Rodolphe Madère, the World Package 7 leaders, will present the session on Burden the European Animal Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network and Vet Medicine with their guest speakers. Sadika, Teresa needs a little bit more time. If you can talk a little bit, please. Yeah. In this session. I don't know what happened with the camera. I will we will to... present the achievement and what was done during the last three years and a half and how we build this ears vet. And then let me give the floor to Christina and Rodolphe, if you are ready. Yes, we are ready. <laughs> yeah, can you hear us? Well, let's start with the uh, session. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session on uh, building the European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network in Veterinary Medicine. Uh, my name is Cristina Muñoz. I am working at the Spanish Medicine Alliance, and I'm the coordinator for the Spanish National Action Plan. Today is our pleasure to present you where we are in relation with this nice project. Rodolf, please. Thank you, Christina, and hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are very happy to, uh, to introduce this session and have you uh, around us to, so that we can tell you more about our um, project that was about designing the European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network in veterinary medicine. Uh, it was a pleasure to lead this work uh, with the supervision of Christina. And uh, I guess now it's the time to, to launch the video summarizing some of our uh, achievements.
Having strong One Health surveillance systems for antimicrobial resistance is one of the pillars to tackle this global health threat. Currently, the European Union coordinates antimicrobial resistance surveillance through two of its agencies. In the medical sector, the ECDC monitors AMR in diseased individuals through the EARS net and the FWD net. In the animal and food sectors, the EFSA monitors AMR in zoonotic and commensal bacteria from healthy food producing animals and food thereof. The monitoring of EFSA provides useful information to assess the risk of AMR transmission from animals to humans through the food chain. It is necessary to complement the current monitoring system by an AMR surveillance component covering bacterial pathogens of animals. These bacteria currently represent a major surveillance gap in the One Health strategy of the EU to tackle AMR. It is also necessary to start monitoring AMR in companion animals. Current antimicrobial resistance surveillance reports have got limited help to veterinary practitioners and policymakers seeking to improve antimicrobial stewardship in animals. Monitoring AMR in bacterial pathogens of animals in Europe will make a difference in the fight against AMR. Several European countries have already set up national surveillance systems of AMR in clinical animal isolates, yet they are highly diverse and fragmented. Other countries are also in the process of setting up their surveillance system, but without any European framework. Many other European countries currently lack AMR surveillance systems in diseased animals. There is an urgent need to build the European Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network in veterinary medicine Ears vet. By complementing and integrating with AMR monitoring systems of the ECDC and EFSA, Ears vet could represent a major step towards a stronger One Health strategy for AMR surveillance. EU Gemrai has set up a multidisciplinary group of 30 experts from 14 European countries. Together and in uh, consultation with relevant stakeholders, we have developed a Ears Vet surveillance framework. The main objectives of Ears Vet would be inform on AMR occurrence in specific animal pathogens, contribute to the development of evidence based guidelines for antimicrobial prescriptions in animals, investigate direct links between antimicrobial consumption and AMR support risk assessment of human exposure to AMR from animals via non-food related routes, provide timely information for policymakers and medicines agencies, contribute to estimating the burden of AMR in the animal sector. Ears Vet would operate as a network of national surveillance systems of AMR in diseased animals, similarly to Ears Net in the human sector. It has been designed following a bottom-up approach so that it takes into account what is relevant and feasible to monitor for national surveillance systems. Regarding the EARS vet surveillance scope, it was agreed to include 220 combinations of animal species, production types, specimens, bacterial species, and antibiotics of interest to the animal health and human health. The group of experts discussed a harmonization strategy and defined antimicrobial susceptibility testing standards. It was also agreed to collect quantitative AMR data. The next steps will consist in launching a NIRSVET pilot phase. Participating countries will start to share and jointly analyze their data to finally produce the first NIRSVET surveillance report. To ensure the sustainability of NIRSVET, we need strong political commitment. On the short term, we use EU and national decision makers to provide financial support for the ERS VET pilot phase, and we encourage member states to join this initiative. On the long term, ERS VET could be taken over by a EU body that receives a mandate to coordinate AMR surveillance in diseased animals. This would ensure the integration of ERS VET within the European landscape and contribute to achieving a stronger One Health surveillance of AMR.
In human health, the antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial consumption data from European countries is shared with the ECDC and assessed on a yearly basis. In order to shorten the time gap between data collection and its assessment, EU JAMRAI has piloted a near real-time surveillance system. For a two and a half year period, 17 partners from 11 countries participated in the study, collecting 41 indicators each trimester. Data was provided from hospitals and primary care at local, regional or national levels. Our aim with this study is to strengthen the current surveillance system in human health. Increasing the frequency of antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial consumption data collection will help healthcare centers, health systems, member states gain advantage in the fight against antimicrobial resistance towards better health outcomes in the population. In addition to increasing the frequency of data collection, this quarterly based surveillance system has introduced new indicators to increase the knowledge of antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial consumption from healthcare centres. This allows each healthcare centre to monitor the evolution of their own data and carry out interventions on a timelier manner at local, regional, national or European level. The results of this pilot show that the implementation of a near real-time surveillance system in the EU is possible. The requirements to make it a reality are more institutional support, dedicating human resources, coordination of microbiological and antimicrobial consumption data sources, which implies more homogeneous indicators and modern integrated IT systems. Great, thanks for again for the communication team for preparing this video, um, which also highlighted some results of uh, uh, surveillance in the human medicine too. But now we are um, about to focus on the ears vet, and I am delighted to um, introduce Ernesto Libana from the European Food Safety Authority, who is going to give the keynote speech. The floor is yours, and Thank you, Rodolphe, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and uh, EPSA really thanks uh, Jan Rai for inviting us to, to open this, uh, this session. I'm not quite sure if I should share my presentation or if somebody would do it for me. Uh, just let me know, and I'll do what is best. Do you know? OK. Uh, we Okay, so I hope I hope you can see it now. Yes. I personally do. <laughs> I hope to attend this too. Okay, so if you do. Um, so I will, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I will try to go through this uh, quickly. Um, basically, what I wanted to convey here is, is also the, uh, the, the wishes of EFSA and the work we are doing to move towards this holistic AMR surveillance uh, in food producing animals in Europe. Uh, we heard very nicely from your video a lot of the things that I will also uh, be saying, saying here. So I don't have to remind anybody of how important it is to pull data on resistance uh, in a harmonious way uh, from countries uh, across Europe. And how important it is also to make use of the data, not only in resistance, but the data in consumption. And all these uh, give us a huge power to be able to support the action plans that the Commission have to try to uh, combat uh, this, this problem in Europe and, and hopefully also showing the others uh, how, how to do things and, and lead the way. So um, as you uh, quickly mentioned, EFSA is in charge of doing the, uh, collecting the data from member states on uh, monitoring in food producing animals and that is mostly for uh, foodborne pathogens and commensals. New legislation came into place very, very recently, only beginning of this year, and it will continue until 2027. 
and it has changed a bit um, compared to what we were doing in the past. Uh, so a few things have been improved. Uh, we continue with this biannual uh, rotating basis, uh, changing the species that we monitor. And uh, together with our colleagues in ECDC, we produce a, a One Health report every year. So I'm not uh, going to go in detail through these, but you have the different uh, animal species that we survey. Uh, we focus on the bacteria that uh, everybody knows about, Campylobacter, Salmonella, uh, E. coli, uh, sometimes also Enterococcus and, and MRSAs. We collect the number of samples per year, mostly at the slaughter, uh, but also in some cases we take advantage of existing programs like the one in Salmonella and the sampling is done at primary production. And also we collect samples at retail. One of the novelties this year is also the incorporation of imported foods in the monitoring, taking samples at border control points also. And you have also some uh, details here about the sampling design to, to uh, ensure that the, the sample size and the isolates we collect are representative. So as I mentioned, all of this uh, gathers together in what we call a One Health Report on AMR although uh, we are uh, also aware that there is a, an important component which is missing. Hopefully it will come in the future. Uh, there is a, a large emphasis on this One Health. and We try to cover uh, critical important antimicrobials for humans. That is our main drive uh, right now and explore temporal trends, uh, key indicators, and also try to indicate when there are emerging issues coming to, to uh, the, the uh, scenario here. We are very much aware also of the importance of the environment and how neglected this has been in recent times. So the Biohaz panel started already a year and a half ago working on this self-task mandate that is due to be uh, finalized very soon in April uh, this year. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it had to be postponed by two or three months. Otherwise, it would be already out. And uh, basically here to, to summarize that everything is interconnected. So animal farms, uh, human uh, uh, sewage, uh, all kind of uh, influx and efflux uh, come together and, and form this very, very complex uh, environmental picture. So with this mandate, we are trying to map uh, the main, uh, it's very much focused on food production environments, and we are trying to map the main sources and routes of transmission, try to establish a priority on combinations of bacteria and resistances and advice uh, to our, our risk managers and strategies to control options. So perhaps one of the recommendations here would also be to include some kind of monitoring in the environmental compartment. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have also started working in EFSA and, and we are lucky enough to have some of you also as members of this uh, working group on listing and uh, categorizing transmissible animal diseases caused by bacterial resistance to antimicrobials. And this is in the frame of the new animal health law. So I think it is, has been indicated uh, that there are no harmonized rules for the surveillance of AMR in bacteria. And the European Commission uh, is uh, wishing to explore this area with a view of listing some of these resistant pathogens for uh, future action. So uh, we have three terms of reference for this mandate. First is to do a global uh, review uh, of the literature and of the data existing to try to come up with a priority list of pathogens that cause transmissible animal diseases, and this is a key point. And then to summarize what is the current uh, situation in the EU and identify those relevant bacteria with the final aim to end up listing this uh, uh, in the relevant annexes of the animal health law. So things take time, and this is only the very beginning of uh, potentially increasing the way uh, the harmonized monitoring is done in Europe. And as you know, uh, once there is clarity on, on the listing of these agents, uh, then what happens typically is that uh, EFSA uh, receives a further request for technical advice where we have to shape the way the, the monitoring should be done, the methodology used, the sampling schemes, uh, the animal species to be monitored, et cetera, et cetera. So I think all the work that you are doing in ERSVET would be highly valuable to guide uh, those efforts in, in the future. Um, this uh, 
work uh, specifically on, on animal uh, or veterinary pathogens will not be completed until kind of uh, towards half, second half of, of 2021. But what's the space? Because after that, we should have at least uh, an answer to, to what uh, bacteria and resistances will be listed and, and where we would focus our attention. And that's all I wanted to, uh, to say uh, for now. So thank you very much. And I'm, I will be delighted to answer questions or participate later on in the, in the round table. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto, for your very clear and, and nice presentation. Uh, and I hope that we can uh, collaborate in the future. Yeah, and now is the uh, quiz time. We have a, a, a quiz, really very easy quiz, so don't uh, be saying and um, participate, please. We have five questions in relation with this project, ESPED. And the first one is, um, uh, is very basic. Uh, question: What does ERSPET means? You have to tick only one, and uh, there are three different possibilities: the European Association of Veterinary Otologies, the European uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network in Veterinary Medicine, or uh, C, not idea. Please tick one, but not least uh, this last one. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that is 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 time enough to answer the question. So, okay. so do we go to the next one? All right. So, what animal species are currently included in the ears vet scope? Tick all that apply. Livestock, cattle, pigs, and poultry. Fisheries, companion animals, dogs and cats, or finally exotic animals. I hope you can see the answers. Okay. Uh, the next question is in relation with the, um, uh, your opinion, and I would like to know, in your opinion, what is the main opportunity to build ASVET? You have uh, pro four different uh, possibilities. Many countries already have uh, surveillance in animal pathogens. The animal health law opens for the possibility to monitor AMR in animal pathogens. The EU young right will a preliminary aspect network and EU young right too. So maybe let's go to the fourth question. Okay, uh, so in your opinion, what is the main challenge to build your spend? Existing surveillance systems are not harmonized, current data are not comparable, ERSVET needs sustainable funding, or ERSVET is not regulated. And as I, it seems that we are a little bit late. <laughs> Maybe I think Christina, it's okay. 
to for the last question because the attendees are a bit ahead of us. Yes. Yeah. Let's see the, the last question, which is uh, uh, what can you do to uh, further support the development of a year's bed? For this question, you have uh, to take all that you think apply. And we have four uh, different possibilities uh, promote ERs bet among EU uh, decision makers, promote ERs bet among national stakeholders, prom uh, provide funding, and provide technical expertise and or data. So let me directly confirm that EARSVET is indeed the European AMR Surveillance Network in Veterinary Medicine. Almost all of you have had it right. Um, the main opportunity to build EARSVET, oh, it was quite balanced. I guess any of them could be an opportunity. Depends, should debate on it. Uh, the challenge to build EARSVET. Um, so most answers for harmonization and sustainable funding, but in practice, all of them are could be considered as challenges. And finally, for the development of your vet, you're right. It's I mean uh, everyone, all answers were quite balancedly uh, answered, and uh, all of them could uh, help us further develop your vet. So congratulations to everyone. So now we may uh, start the round table. Um, so we have many participants. Uh, thanks again for uh, accepting. So we have uh, representatives from countries. So Lucy Potludova from the Czech Republic. Uh, we have uh, Maria Eleni Filipici from uh, Belgium. We have Christos Aferidis from Greece. We have Lucy Colino from France. Um, and then from um, European agencies, uh, we still have Ernesto Olivana from EFSA, we, we have Dominique Monet from ECDC, and we have Helen Dukes from EMA, the European Medicines Agency. Christina, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today for this table to all of you. And let's start with the first question. The first question is going to, to both Lucy's, Lucy Polova and Lucy Coulomb, and is in relation with your uh, national monitoring system, because uh, your, talk, uh, your countries, your uh, countries uh, uh, have set up a national monitoring uh, system for, for antimicrobial resistance covering this part of the bacterial uh, pathogens of animals. So can you please uh, uh, explain um, why are such systems so useful as part of your uh, national action plan to tackle antimicrobial resistance? What do you think? Please, uh, Lucy Palova first, and then Lucy Colón. Oh, thank you for uh, giving me the floor, Christina, and good morning to everybody, uh, or good early afternoon, maybe. It's more proper to say. Uh, just briefly uh, to summarize uh, the Czech uh, uh, national monitoring and how it's participating in the national action plan. Uh, so it's an organic part uh, of uh, this uh, national action plan. It's taking some time to establish it, but it's six years ago already we did it. Uh, for me, uh, the most important thing and usefulness is that we are communicating within the National Action Plan in all three areas. It means human health, animal health and environment. So I think that it's, it's great that, uh, that we are interconnected. Uh, and uh, to be honest, Ernesto uh, Liebana presented uh, the monitoring of uh, AMR in healthy animals and in food and it is somehow a consequence of the use of antimicrobials in animals. And what we should do, we should influence the first part. It means the starting of treating the animals. And uh, for this reason, it's uh, somehow complementary to set this AMR monitoring for uh, diseased animals and more uh, help to veterinarians in clinical practice to rationalize the treatment 
and, uh, and therapy options. Uh, why it's useful? We built our network, network of laboratories, network of sampling systems. We harmonized uh, methodologies, we harmonized interpretation of the results. And finally, last but not least, uh, we should mention also uh, the question of economy. So we incentivize uh, farmers and veterinarians to do susceptibility testing via this, that we are financing MIC testing. So I think it's, it's of importance. Uh, last thing I would like to mention, and I started with this, uh, it is communication. Because once you analyze the results, you can provide uh, the uh, results as a trends, you can communicate it to the human area, and also uh, you can share it with policy makers and policy uh, making decision uh, based on evidence from your country. So I think it's uh, very crucial and uh, of a big importance that you have the data for your countries, for your uh, regions and for uh, certain animal species to be treated by your clinicians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Lucy. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share our experience with the RESAPAT, the French and Syrians network for MR surveillance and animal pathogens. Um, as some of you may know, this uh, RESAPAT network has been established for more than 40 years now. So a pretty well established system that collects more or less uh, 50,000 antibiograms each year from both domestic and companion animals via uh, a passive surveillance network involving uh, 70 laboratories. Uh, for us, this uh, RESAPAT network has been um, a major component for as part of our national action plan for various reasons. I think an important aspect is that um, the RESAPAT collects AMR data that are very close to the point of administration. So we are in, in an excellent position to study association between usage and resistance and also identify um, AMR hotspots in animal pathogens that are useful to provide our veterinarians with um, evidence-based recommendation for good antimicrobial treatment practices. And by monitoring how trends are evolving over time, we can also support decision makers in evaluating interventions such as antimicrobial stewardship programs. I think another important aspect is that uh, via the RESAPAT, we cover animal species and bacteria that are not covered otherwise, especially companion animals, and also bacteria that are of interest for animal health and human health. And finally, I would say a third important aspect is that the RESAPAT is for us an important source of um, collection of bacterial strains. Uh, so we have a very good co um, collection uh, to work with. And uh, beyond routine surveillance, we can also perform advanced molecular characterization of our strains. And these are diagnostic strains, which is uh, also what our human counterparts are working with. So that sort of open up um, many opportunities for surveillance and research collaboration across sector, uh, especially between human and uh, animal sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucies. Um, so now uh, a question for um, Marilena and Christos, who are in countries who are planning to set up their uh, national monitoring system uh, uh, of AMR in diseased animals. Uh, I have three questions for you, uh, which is maybe uh, too much uh, in, in the remaining time. So um, um, just do your best to be uh, as, uh, as summarized as possible. So basically, my first question would be, what are the main challenges for countries which are planning to build their uh, national monitoring system. How did EU GMRI support your um, efforts to uh, build this national system? And finally, uh, what are the next steps uh, for you to, to build this uh, national surveillance system? Um, women first. So, uh, Marilena, uh, I let you start, and then uh, Christos, uh, you can second. Thank you. Thank you, Rodolphe. I will try to be as concise as possible. Uh, so at this stage, the main challenge that we're facing in Belgium is the lack of coordination at national level. And that is because there is no national action plan put in place yet. The decisions need to be taken at the political level so that decisions can also be taken um, by the competent authorities. And at this point, I would like to say, uh, I would like to highlight the, the role of the regions uh, in Belgium in decision making, so the Flemish and the Walloon regions, uh, and that is a particularity of the country. 
in the same line, another challenge would be to identify incentives uh, for the private labs to participate in such a system. Currently, the majority of testing for AMR in clinical isolates is performed at these labs uh, that are also based in different regions. So these would be the first challenges that we're facing. Uh, I'm not going to go into further detail since we don't have much time. Regarding your second question, uh, the involvement of, uh, in, of Belgium in AERSVAD was an excellent opportunity to unite different parties and to bring all the actors together. Uh, these actors in Belgium are Cienzano, that is the Federal Research Institute for Public and Animal Health, AMCRA, the Center of Knowledge for Antimicrobial Use and Resistance, the laboratories and the competent authorities. So this work has been very helpful to share experience, lessons learned, and most particularly best practices within our country, but also with other countries. Um, so in this regard, interviews that were performed with people from the labs were very useful to sensitize them uh, further on this topic and also the visit of Iggy Jamre to Belgium was a very good opportunity to bring up the discussion and to also show the authorities the way to go uh, with examples from other countries. Uh, regarding your last question, the main next step is that the national action plan is politically approved um, in the coming months. Uh, there has been a delay because of COVID um, we changed the priorities at political level, and then a budget and impact assessment should be also done. Um, that was the situation in Belgium in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marilena. Um, Christos, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christos Aferidis, member of the task force of the implementation uh, the task force of the Ministry of Rural Development and Food regarding the implementation of the national action plan at risk. Uh, regarding uh, the first question, uh, there are many challenges uh, that we have uh, regarding this uh, initiative, but in Greece we have some organizational issues uh, regarding the veterinarian uh, sector uh, that we must overcome. Uh, for example, that most laboratories are in the private sector. And we need a laboratory information system more harmonized, and we are working on it. Regarding the second question, uh, how did the UHM uh, uh, support our aim? Uh, in Greece, we strongly believe that ARZ will enable our country to share experience with veterinary AMR surveillance, uh, like characterize, characterize, characterize AMR trends. Um, advise policy makers, uh, put in use of antimicrobials, etc. And uh, to move to the last question, what uh, will be the next steps in my country to advance the establishment of national monitoring system? We are starting a pilot project uh, to monitor staphylococcus uh, aureus in deceased dairy cows over 18 months. And uh, in pigs, uh, uh, in this is pigs, and this is in this is in general, and in this is pigs uh, to monitor a in uh, this is pigs excluded, uh, excluded boars, and so on. So, this final project will start next month, and we think that this will support um, our efforts. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, we are starting a training program. Uh, regarding the microbial resistance uh, and the implementation of our national action plan, uh, action plan to veterinarians, doctors, and representatives of the Ministry of Environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christos, for uh, being brief. Very nice to see that it's advancing in both your countries. Hopefully, the NAP will be endorsed soon in Belgium, and uh, happy to see the data collection will start soon in Greece. Um, <laughs> Now we will move uh, to a question for um, ECDC, EFSA, and EMA. Um, so regarding, more, regarding the European integration. Um, so first question would be for the three of you, uh, could you share the perspective of your agency, so EFSA, ECDC, and EMA, regarding the development of EARSET, please? Maybe we can start with Helen. 
Thank you very much, Rodolf, and thank you for um, inviting the EMA to participate at this um, conference. Um, we're very keen to uh, support the EARSVET initiative. Um, you may not know, but um, from 2022, a new veterinary regulation will come into application. Um, and um, under that regulation, the EMA will start to collect data on antimicrobial consumption um, from all of the member states. And those data will be submitted on a per species uh, basis starting from 2024. Um, by 2027, we expect to have data for all food producing species and for other species by 2030. Um, this obviously um, opens the door for us to be able to um, potentially look at um, uh, integrating those consumption data with the resistance data on target pathogens that would be collected by, um, by the ISVET project. Um, at the moment, uh, the JIACRA project um, uh, integrates the data that's collected under the surveillance programs from um, ECDC, EFSA and the EMA on antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic consumption, um, but it's focused um, entirely on uh, the public health angle. So it's only looking at the data that are, are um, collected in that respect. So having data on target pathogens um, would open, potentially open the door for, as I mentioned, for other possibilities as well. Um, and then just also briefly to mention, um, obviously EMA's other major role is in the authorization of veterinary medicines. Um, at the moment, once we've authorized products, um, we do try to review them um, when we have information received through pharmacovigilance reports that there could be problems with resistance emerging in the field. But unfortunately, that system is, um, uh, unfortunately, it's quite unreliable um, as uh, vets very rarely report cases of lack, lack of efficacy to us. So having these data from EARSVET available um, will certainly um, give us much better evidence base um, for us to be able to update those marketing authorizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helen, and uh, totally agree that uh, this uh, new regulation is a real opportunity for better understanding uh, the, the links between AMU and AMR per animal species. Um, yes, um, maybe the floor now to Dominic Monet, please. Yeah, thank you. I mean, first, IDCDC would like to congratulate you, all the colleagues who contributed to EARSVET and the joint action for this achievement. But as you know, ACDC doesn't have a mandate for veterinary medicine, so we cannot integrate ESVET as part of ECDC activities. Now, we will certainly be happy to keep a good communication with you and, and with ESVET, but I would prefer EFSA to, to speak about integration and, and perspective. Okay, definitely. Uh, we know the mandate of ECDC is really only focused on, uh, on the human sector. In any case, it was uh, really useful for us to get your feedback on technical details. And uh, we learned a lot uh, thanks to you for, for building uh, your set. We already got some, yeah, you're welcome. You, we already got some uh, insights from Ernesto. Maybe you have uh, some final words on, on the EFSA perspective regarding your set. Thank you, Rodolf. Yes, yes. Uh, basically, just a few reflections also on my own. And I think it's, it's uh, true to say that traditionally this area of, of monitoring of resistance in animal pathogens was thought to be a problem um, from industry that should be solved by industry, meaning that the, the final users, as you said, are the farming industry and, and, and the vets themselves. And I think there was a bit of a reluctancy to put public money into something which is not public health because it was for the benefit of the industry uh, as such. I think now with all these Jayakpara reports that Helen mentioned, I think it's, it's more and more clear that there is really a, a clear correlation between the use of antimicrobials in animals, in food animals, and the resistance we see in humans. So I think that argument perhaps does not really uh, hold true anymore. And I think it's, it's important to, to have this holistic view that no matter uh, what you use, I mean, the, the, the primary, uh, the starting point is the use in animals. So you would also have a contribution to the resistance in human pathogens and in, in public health. So I think it's important to look at that. 
I think what is really important is to convince, and when I say convince, is showing scientific arguments, our risk managers, and also the member states to put resource in, into these. And that is where we have the, now the, the challenge. So the first steps are ongoing. I think uh, let's hope that the, the Commission will agree to include in this annex for the animal health law uh, at least uh, some of these uh, combinations. And then from now on, uh, from that moment on, if they find this uh, appropriate, we will have to advise on shaping a new monitoring program. So harmonizing of methods, uh, having clear specifications in law so that every member state does things in the same way. And then, of course, data collection. So I'm pretty sure if that takes uh, place, then EFSA will be tasked with collecting the data and reporting it and integrating it in the One Health uh, report and uh, this is where I see the, the the overlap of course with EOSBET because you have been already doing a lot of these things so it would be uh, stupid of us not to take all the work done into account and uh, and that would be a very very good starting ground uh, when that moment comes but I think as I mentioned it's the beginning of a long journey uh, thinking that we have started with new legislation now this year uh, it, it would perhaps take some years before we see a fully harmonized, uh, in spite of what is going on at each member state level, which uh, is highly encouraging that there is already something starting the, uh, there. So that's a bit the EFSA perspective, and, and we welcome your initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Um, Christina, maybe for the final question? Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for your uh, 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 Comment and your perspective, Ernesto. Yeah, I think that the, the last question is going to Lucy Colau because she is uh, uh, involved um, uh, in this project and she uh, knows very well the project. So my question is in relation with the future of the uh, uh, project because uh, Jan Ray will soon uh, uh, be over. So I would like to know, uh, Lucy, could you tell us a, a, a few words in relation with the next step of ERSPED? What do you think about the, 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 the next step? Thank you, Christina. Yes, so I guess when we have um, understood today that uh, the JMRI achievement really set the basis for ESBIT, um, defined the vision and the objectives, um, also the, the scope and standard for this, uh, for this network. We also have um, built a sort of preliminary network of um, countries and partners interested uh, to get involved. So I think there's a lot of interest uh, from uh, the ESVET participant to continue um, with uh, the development of ESVET. And so there are um, different um, activities that are planned uh, in both a short and more mid to long term. Uh, an important step will be to launch a pilot study where um, participating countries can give it a try to actually share data and uh, assess the level of comparability. Another important aspect will be to work towards harmonization. So there is a plan to develop an ESVET manual where we can describe the ESVET uh, methods and standards and to, pro to provide some guidance uh, on AMR surveillance in animal pathogens, uh, both for countries that already have a system to align with, but also to facilitate and support the development of a uh, new system in those countries that currently have none. And um, finally, another important aspect will be to work towards the sustainability of ESVIT. So obviously by working in close collaboration with uh, European agencies, and especially EFSA, um, to, to ensure that you know, ESVIT can integrate at some point when time comes. Um, uh, we can build on the work that's been um, done by ESVIT um, should um, you know, uh, surveillance in animal pathogens be taken over by EFSA, which we are very keen to hear. Um, we also have to think about technical sustainability, you know, AMR surveillance is evolving. Um, many countries are moving towards um, uh, world genome sequences uh, approaches, so we should also prepare for possible future integration of molecular data. And obviously an important aspect as well is economic sustainability. So as we have discussed earlier, uh, surveillance in animal pathogen is not regulated today, so it's up to every country you know, to put resources uh, in, into this activity. So as a sort of first step in this direction, we have submitted an application uh, for cost action funding, and we are hoping to hear back in, uh, in May um, this year. So yeah, hopefully we can uh, continue for further progress on this. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lucy. Thank you. And hopefully uh, uh, we can continue with the project. Uh, we need the participation of all of you 
to go further with the project uh, with the project and uh, you know we are better and strong together so we need all of you to go further with the project uh, we have a, a more question but unfortunately we don't have time so uh, now we have to to close this session now uh, thank you so much for your participation and thank you so much for your comment and your uh, ideas in relation with this project and uh, your support. And uh, I, I hope that we have to, to work sooner uh, together uh, to develop more this project. So bye and Rodolf, I pass you the floor to say goodbye. Yes, thank you, Christina. Thanks to everyone. That was a short but uh, dynamic and exciting uh, uh, session. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. And I see that the stars are kind of aligned for uh, improving AMR surveillance in target pa uh, bacterial pathogens of animals in the future. So thanks a lot for everyone. And uh, Sadika, I give you the floor now. Thank you, Adolf. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. It is, it was very constructive and wonderful exchange. Uh, this is absolutely not a task for the health sector alone. That's what is needed. Human and animal health sectors working together nationally and at the European and the global level in collaboration with all sectors. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us. So, in line of what said, the WHO the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Organization of, for Animal Health speak with one voice and take collective action to minimize the emergence and spread of EMR. What are the goals to attain? What is needed in this fight against EMR? I'm delighted to welcome Danilo Fo Wong from WHO. Danilo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sedeka. And while I'm sharing my screen. Um, I just want to take the time to uh, to congratulate everybody who's been involved in EU Gemini uh, to make this uh, the success that it is. And, and I really hope uh, that we can build on, on, on collaboration moving forward. And I think the, the presentation I'm about to give is very much in line with what you've heard before, uh, the need for a One Health approach, the need for moving forward together asked to tell you a little bit about the uh, the upcoming or the, the regional tripartite joint secretariat on antimicrobial resistance that we are setting up. Um, I just spent half an hour on this talk. I know that, uh, that we are late uh, on just on this slide alone and I know we are already late and I'm standing between you and the rest of your day so I will I will not of course um, but some of you may recognize this from the, uh, the final report of the interagency coordination group uh, that was that was established after the uh, UN General Assembly in 2016. It's quite a busy slide, it has, but it has a lot of information on some of the main sectors involved in One Health, uh, on the main uh, recommendations as provided by this uh, interagency coordination group and the sustainable goals that they are affecting. But one thing that this picture has uh, has in, in common is that's a very strong role foreseen for the tripartite organizations. And the tripartite organizations, as, as uh, you may well know, are the Food and Agriculture World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, and the World Health Organization. Now, these organizations have a long-standing collaboration already. Um, even before uh, 2010, they were, they were doing things together, but they formalized it a little bit more in a concept note in, in 2010. And even though they have been working on AMR between 2010 and 2018, it was only in 2018 that there was a tripartite memorandum of understanding specifically for antimicrobial resistance. And also um, that year also we reached out uh, to involve more of the One Health uh, interface by reaching out to the UN uh, Agency for Environment and, and started calling it Tripartite Plus. The plus of course is leaves room open for, for more and more partners. Um, there was a tripartite work plan that was developed in September 2018. Uh, in 2019, in June, in a, in a big conference in the Netherlands, the multi-partner trust fund was launched. And uh, subsequently, there was the uh, development in a tripartite joint secretariat uh, of the three organizations uh, hosted by WHO. 
And of course, they have a joint, uh, working on a joint framework for monitoring and evaluating the global action plan uh, implementation. There's also a, quite a long history and a good history of tripartite collaboration in the European region. Um, we've held several meetings uh, to help and support countries uh, with the national action plan development and sharing good experiences of implementation. We've had several tripartite missions. We have been uh, working together on, on uh, some joint material, but also aligning our messages for the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. And of course, we are responsible for multi-partner trust fund projects in our region, of which there is now only one uh, pilot project in Tajikistan. And of course, we're also responsible for, uh, for getting your, your responses, your country responses in the tripartite AMR Country Self-Assessment Survey or TRAC. Now here you see some, uh, some results of the, the, the tracks from last year. This one is particularly on the question of whether or not countries uh, have a national action plan and to which degree they, uh, they are developed. Um, it's, a, it's a typical the traffic light map made famous by ECDC. Um, red means that there's the, no action plan. There's only very few countries that do not have a plan yet. Most of them uh, are either developed or developed. And uh, quite a few have already uh, started their implementation. But the whole process towards, you know, defining a, a national action plan, all the support was, was given in a, not in a very systematic way. We've helped some countries, FAO and OIE, EU Gemri helped countries, others, and ECDC, et cetera. So it was not a necessarily a very concerted um, effort. I just did a, a the little, the little map there is the, the, the world, the global. Similarly to One Health coordination or these intersectoral coordination groups, this is also self-reported data from last year. Um, you can see that it's a quite a, quite a mixed mixed picture, and it also shows you how difficult it is to bring the sectors together at national level and to actually have a functional uh, intersectoral coordination mechanism. And again, but you know, compared to the rest of the world, uh, the, the region is doing. But there's a lot of work to be done, and, and uh, I think that there is a really a need for, for closer and more coordinated uh, tripartite coordination and collaboration in the region. One thing for sure is that uh, our combined mandates and competitive advantage uh, can provide a very strong leadership that is needed for coordinated action across all sectors in all countries of the region. As we've seen right now, there's many initiatives that are uh, Supporting and trying to attempt to do the same thing, but nobody really has the overview. So also building on that by providing uh, oversight and guidance in, in one central place, we can avoid duplication, uh, facilitate collaboration and synergy and ensure that all the gaps and the country needs are addressed. But also at the national level, uh, what we've seen when we have these stakeholder meetings, it's, it's not always easy to we have access to, to uh, main actors in the different sectors. So even though we try to convene one health meetings, it's not always easy to get to the right people. But, but combined, we have uh, the right context to convene national stakeholders across all the sectors um, and really urge them to take the responsibility and commit to the implementation of their national action plan. Because I think this is also what is still lacking in many countries. There may be a plan, but the actual commitment to achieve something, the, the taking on responsibility and accountability that is still lacking. And I think together we'll be very much stronger in encouraging countries to do that. And finally, also, of course, Europe, the European region is, is not an island. It's connected both globally and to the other regions. So also through, through our connections with other tripartite structures at the global and regional level, we can make sure that we have the global concerted action. Um, and to launch this idea, we held a, a seminar in, uh, in November last year during the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, jointly with the, also with the European Commission and the Eurasian Economic Committee uh, to launch the idea of, of European coordination and, um, and setting up a mechanism for that. So ever since then, we've been now uh, developing you know, what does that structure look like? And getting some inspiration from other regions and also uh, what is done in the headquarter level. So 
So we are suggesting that the tripartite coordination mechanism in Europe will look something like this. We have a, a two-tiered approach, one tier to ensure high-level coordination and strong political support across all the One Health areas, which is still very much needed. And secondly, uh, a tier that is dedicated uh, to a coordinated technical delivery of, of uh, at country level through specific uh, regional tripartite joint secretariats. For example, if it looked something like this, we have a, a One Health coordination group with the regional directors of the organizations there. And of course, there has to be some sort of a, a, a body uh, that is also providing input and, and advice to the One Health coordination group. And underneath that, you have specific regional tripartite joint secretariats that can focus on the area. But I think if, if we try to focus on everything at the same time, it will be very, very difficult. And AMR is complex as it is. So for now, we want to start with, uh, with AMR. And, and again, uh, to try to focus, uh, focus our efforts and have a dedicated uh, joint secretary. Now, the terms of reference for this joint secretariat are uh, inspired by the, the terms of reference of the global joint secretariat. Uh, but we're still, still in the working. Actually, later today, we'll have a meeting uh, with the regional directors of FBO and OIE to discuss some more of the details. So this is uh, still rather rough and, uh, and the ink is not even dry. But first of all, of course, we need to, to coordinate the interagency engagement and partnerships. This is where some sort of a partnership platform comes in uh, and, and to make sure that we have a concerted action. We also need to, to coordinate and monitor our own a, a regional tripartite action and implementation, plus all the networks that we are representing, all the partners that we are um, We will be in a position to, to map gaps and, and, uh, and see opportunities and share these with, with our partners uh, to make sure that these gaps are, are addressed and opportunities are taken. And as I mentioned before, the multi-partner trust fund is is already it's on its way and we foresee that more and more projects will be uh, will be granted and of course we also have a role to play in, in, in managing that and reporting on that etc so basically in short and i also mindful of the time um, the regional tripartite joint secretariat on antimicrobial resistance is tasked with coordinating joint action against amr making optimal use of available resources foster synergies and avoid duplication of efforts by mobilizing stakeholders and partners across the region. So, apartheid is united, uh, but of course, we cannot do this alone. We need your help. Thank you very much for your attention. You have addressed an enormous range of issues, Danilo. Thank you very much uh, uh, for joining us. We come to the end of the first day of the final conference of the JAMRAI. On behalf of the coordination and communication team, I would like to thank all of those who are attending today, as well as those who were unable to attend, but who have shared video message. We, Thanks to the communication team, are happy to share these unforgettable moments. Our warmest greeting to all who contributed to this action. It has been such a collaborative effort. We have worked together hard. It was a fantastic opportunity to live with this and support you on this challenge and action that will genuinely leave a lasting mark. Also, on this Women in Science Day, let us applaud your undertaken efforts, ladies. Thank you once again, and see you tomorrow at 9 a.m.